Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Cockrell, and I work in the Office of Energy Policy and Innovation here at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. We are happy to welcome you to this staff-led workshop to discuss whether and how the Commission should establish a minimum requirement for interregional transfer capability for public utility transmission providers in transmission planning and cost allocation processes. Before we begin, I'll outline some logistics for our virtual workshop. First, we do have commissioners in attendance um, and they will be providing opening statements. Um, then we will have a presentation from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and a panel discussion on determining the need for and benefits of additional interregional transfer capability. After a short break, we will continue with a brief presentation from the US Department of Energy's Grid Deployment Office and our second panel discussion, which will be on considerations for establishing potential interregional transfer capability requirements. We'll conclude today's portion of the workshop at 5 p.m. Eastern time, and tomorrow we'll resume our workshop from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. This workshop is being webcast to YouTube, transcribed, and recorded for future viewing. And although this is a staff-led workshop, FERC commissioners may attend and ask questions during the workshop. The views staff may express at this workshop are those of individual staff members and do not necessarily represent the views of the commission or of individual commissioners. I'd also like to remind all participants to refrain from discussing the specific details of pending contested proceedings listed on the supplemental notice issued on November 18th, 2022 in this docket. And to please refrain from any discussion of other pending contested proceedings. If anyone engages in these kinds of discussions, my colleagues Moon Athwal and Gonzalo Rodriguez from the Office of General Counsel will interrupt the discussion and ask the speaker to avoid that topic. Finally, the notice in this proceeding includes two terms we plan on using during this discussion, specifically the terms interregional transfer capability and transfer transmission facility. We'd also like to note that the commission only has jurisdiction over the public utility transmission provider and not over transmission planning regions. Thus, the discussion today and tomorrow will be in the context of the Commission's jurisdiction over public utility transmission providers, um, but we may refer to them as transmission planning regions as a shorthand for discussion purposes. Okay, with those initial things out of the way, um, we're gonna have some opening statements from our commissioners. Um, I do not see Commissioner Danley on, so we will start with Commissioner Clements. Commissioner Clements, go ahead. Thank you, Jessica, and good morning. Um, it's nice to see you all. It's sad we're back on virtual, but glad that it allows us to bring in uh, so many different people. Uh, we've been talking a lot about interregional transmission uh, and interregional tra transfer capability, and you know, there's enormous reliability value, um, and it's hard to estimate in some cases because of the nature of when uh, that value comes to bear. Uh, you know, I often cite to an NREL study that estimates that a fulsome interregional transmission expansion can achieve up to $180 billion in net benefits through 2050. And when you take from that and try and think about what portion of that lives within extreme weather events, the value is likely to be higher. A Berkeley National Lab study focused on these events suggests that 50% of transmission's congestion value comes from only 5% of ours. And of course, we've all heard about the grid strategy study that found that each additional gigawatt of transmission ties between the Texas power grid and the southeastern U.S. could have saved nearly a billion dollars every additional gigawatt while keeping the heat on for hundreds of thousands of Texans. So I've at least heard support from a very broad range of stakeholders for a minimum interregional transfer requirement, including the majority of, of participants in our FERC NARUC state task force. So appreciating the challenge of addressing interregional planning hurdles more broadly, part of appeal of a minimum transfer capability requirement, in addition to its specific reliability benefits, is that it could prove to be a mechanism for aligning regions around a clear goal and then for unifying processes to reach that goal. And that could be modeled more broadly. So on the merits specifically and more broadly, I'm a fan of this concept. Of course, it raises several questions and this is a great time for us to get into the weeds. I hope panelists you all will weigh in on several topics including but not limited to what is the legal basis for requiring a minimum interregional transfer requirement? Assuming that basis exists, how should the minimum be set between regions? What are the technical planning specifications? Who should be involved in the planning process? Is it planning regions, interregional entities, other stakeholders? 
What does the compliance process look like and what's FERC's job here? And of course, we all want to know who's going to pay. So I, I really look forward to um, the chance to hear from all of you in answering those questions as well as some of the other excellent questions that staff have put forward and I appreciate all their hard work in putting uh, these two days together. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Commissioner Clements. Um, next, we'll have Commissioner Mark Christie. Thanks, Jessica. I had to click on the right buttons there. Uh, during during winter storm Uri, we all remember there were several gigs uh, of power transferred from PJM into MISO, and then another several gigs that were transferred from MISO into uh, SPP. And those transfers were essential to keeping lights on during that extreme weather event. So there's really two easy lessons from that incident. Uh, one is uh, interregional transfers can certainly support reliability and be essential in, a, in, a, in an extreme weather event like Uri. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, we have interregional transfer capacity. The question is, is it enough? Um, that's the big question. And how can we get uh, to that number of what is enough? Uh, interregional transfer capacity really is nothing new. Uh, you can go all the way back to the beginning of power pools. And the first one was PJM. And PJM was set up, and those original power pools were set up to enable what we could call interregional uh, transfers. They were they were shifts of power from one LSC, one load serving utility, to another to to enable the receiving utility to keep the lights on in an emergency. And so the concept of interregional transfers uh, from one one territory to another, one state to another. Uh, really goes back decades so there is a value to it and we need to explore that today uh, and then transmission of course has to be built to enable those trans those transfers uh, i look forward to hearing from the speakers today i want to compliment staff putting together very uh, uh very detailed uh two days uh it's got a great agenda a lot of great speakers i want to compliment the speakers all the work you've done because it takes a lot of work to get ready for these things so I want to compliment the speakers compliment staff for all the work you did putting this together i'm just going to be uh, mainly listening uh, and, uh, and of course, I ask you to address the all important questions, one of which is uh, we, we have interregional transfer capacity now. What is enough? What is the appropriate number? And, and then how do the RTOs plan for it? How do they get together with each other and determine uh, what else is needed and how to plan it? And of course, as Commissioner Clements referenced, uh, the all important question is who's going to pay for it? So I look forward to hearing uh, from all the speakers on those very salient questions. And again, thank you to staff for putting this together. Great, uh, great program. And thank you to all the speakers for coming in and taking your time to prepare for this and uh, look forward to listening to you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Commissioner Christie. And next we'll have Commissioner Willie Phillips. Go ahead, Commissioner Phillips. Thank you, Jessica. Hello, everybody. And uh, hello to everyone who uh, is participating today. Um, I'm very, very uh, glad to see the staff has pulled this technical shop conference and workshop together. Uh, since I joined the commission and since we issued the long-term transmission NOPA in April, I have called for looking into whether the commission should require a minimum amount of interregional trans transfer capability. Interregional transmission hits on all of my big priorities. Number one, reliability and resilience, because it strengthens the voltage and minimizes the likelihood of load shedding. Number two, affordability, because it allows ratepayers to access lower cost generation. And number three, sustainability, because it accommodates the demand for more clean energy. Given the likelihood of future extreme weather events and related generation shortfalls, many stakeholders have been asking us to do something. Utilities, generators, RTOs, ISOs, all of these different stakeholders have been calling on us to do something. And states have been asking for this as well. Nehru told us that effective planning must quantify the benefits of enhancing interregional import and export capabilities. As it was mentioned earlier, both Winter Storm URI and the 2014 Polar Vortex these events have shown that greater interregional transfer capability has a significantly significant reliability benefit. But I'm also interested in whether there are economic or other benefits that should factor into what we do. As Commissioner Clements mentioned just a moment ago, Dr. Milstein from the Berkeley National Labs 
She will present on their recent study on the economic value of interregional transmission. Uh, they found that it has significant congestion value, more than double the value of regional transmission. But they also found that we are undervaluing that benefit. And there are a few things, a few other things that I'm especially interested in hearing. Um, I want to hear thoughts on how, how much flexibility the commission should provide to regions for implementing a minimum requirement. And of course, as Commissioner Christie mentioned, Tomorrow we'll tackle the issue of cost allocation and always important, who's gonna pay? Finally, I'd like to note that I take staff led seriously. So while I'll be monitoring these proceedings over the next two days, uh, I don't plan to interject uh, and get in the way. I wanna get out of the way so that staff can build a record that we all can act on expeditiously. So with that, I won't hold you up any longer and I look forward to the presentations. Thank you, Commissioner Phillips, and thanks to all our commissioners for your opening remarks. Um, just checking to make sure no other commissioners have joined us before we move on. All right, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce our moderators for panel one. Um, we'll have Andrew Martin and Michael Hill, both with the Office of Energy Policy and Innovation. Jessica, my name is Andrew Martin, and I'm with the Commission's Office of Energy Policy and Innovation. I will be moderating the first panel today, along with my colleague, Michael Hill, who is also with the Commission's Office of Energy Policy and Innovation. To open our panel, I will now turn to Dr. Dev Milstein from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to present the findings in their recent report titled, Empirical Estimates of Transmission Value Using Locational and Marginal Prices. Dr. Milstein, take it away. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me today. So, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues who've also contributed to this work. They're listed here on this title slide. Let me pull up the slides. And um, I'd also like to thank the Technical Advisory Committee, including folks from Brattle and Grid Strategies as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so, I'm going to provide a high level overview of the research first, and then I'll go into some more details and methods on the methods and specific results. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what we're investigating here is essentially price arbitrage between a set of locations. We look at hourly price differences between selected nodes within the major wholesale markets, and we're just looking in the energy market. We find that interregional transmission offers substantial economic value from price arbitrage alone. The price arbitrage value roughly represents um, production cost savings that could accrue from new transmission. And production cost savings are typically estimated to account for roughly half of total transmission value uh, within multi-value multi transmission studies. So the point is, that this price arbitrage value that we're finding here is an important component of total transmission value. We also found that a small portion of hours accounts for a large portion of this total transmission value. So 50% of the value was contained in only 5% of hours. And this is the, just the price arbitrage value that I'm referring to. This concentration of value in a small number of hours raises concern about the ability of models to accurately represent the total value. So just to put it simply, extreme or rare conditions are, are challenging to model in general. These high value hours were not only associated with extreme weather or newsworthy weather events, or even hours of reported grid stress. They were also occurred during sort of rare but more normal operating conditions. I say normal in, in quotations, and it's an area of our ongoing research to try to understand what are the specific conditions beyond extreme weather events that lead to these high value hours for interregional transmission. So finally, uh, our, our ongoing hypothesis for, for our research now is that transmission value 
may be underestimated in modeling efforts that are used for transmission planning purposes. And we're currently gathering data from existing planning efforts to compare against the values that we found in these price records. All right, so that, that's a high level overview. I'll, I'll move on now into the sort of more detailed introduction and methods and more details on the results. So a key motivating factor here is that the de decision to build transmission depends on cost and benefit trade-offs. And it's important to really get both the cost side and the value side correct when looking at those trade-offs. And so what our, our research is focusing on is just the value side and just one component of the value side. That's the price arbitrage value in the energy markets. So there are many values outside of what we're looking at today, including reliability and also benefits that could be captured potentially in the capacity markets and also benefits related to emission reductions. But we're, only, we're not looking at those other benefits. We're just looking at the energy market arbitrage value. We focus on this topic in particular because there's concern in the literature that this particular value is underestimated. In, in many cases. The price arbitrage value, it's also called congestion value or congestion cost. And it's roughly equal to that of the production cost savings. So the ability to access lower cost generation resources. By using the empirical prices to examine transmission benefits, we are able to include all the effects of real world conditions, including unexpected changes such as generator infrastructure outages or extreme weather and, and other conditions like that. So, and, and as I mentioned, those are conditions that are challenging to simulate. So it's important to look at the actual price records to understand the value there. All right, next slide. So our goal here is not to provide a comprehensive effort of total transmission value, but just some new insight into one component of transmission value price arbitrage value, and we also call it the congestion value. And we'll look at the magnitude of that value and how it's distributed across hours. All right, next slide, please. So in our approach, we're comparing nodal electricity prices at different locations and looking at the price difference between them. I wanna point out a couple important limitations and caveats to this approach. So these nodal prices, LMPs for short, they're marginal prices. So that means they're subject to saturation effects. In other words, as you install more and more transmission between two locations, the price differential between those locations will decline until there's, there's no difference once you have uh, sufficient transmission. So therefore, the values we calculate are for the next unit of transmission added between locations. We did pick hub and zonal nodes, which generally represent aggregated uh, area, um, an aggregated area, and so, so a deeper market. So this should help slow the rate of saturations, um, but there's obviously not unlimited room for, for transmission. So another caveat is that some of the value we see between regions, the interregional transmission, is due to differing, differing structure, market structure and market rules. And some of the pricing difference is also due to electrical losses. But we think the vast majority of the price differences that we see is due to uh, different production costs and not the market rules and losses. But it's important that not 100% of the value is from that. OK, so let's move on. and. Now I'm gonna talk about the specific results here. So, uh, and one more slide here. In this figure, we're showing average price differences between selected locations. And this is not directional. We took the absolute value of the price difference in each hour between these locations and took the average of that over the full time period. Here we're looking at the full time period from 2012 through 2021. So a subset of these links don't have 
data available for that full time period, but all of the links have many years of data available, at least. The values we find here range from two to $77 per megawatt hour. And we consider any value of around $15 per megawatt hour or higher to be relatively large and important. Uh, and we see these larger values across many regions and even including within some regions as well. Uh, next slide. Another way to think about this is the value you would receive if you added a, a 1000 megawatt line connecting the locations we've highlighted here. And so this would be the revenue you'd receive on average per year per 1000 mega line connecting that. And those values range from 20 million to hundreds of millions of dollars per year. And so obviously we're not calculating the cost of connecting these locations. This is just the economic value uh, from within the energy markets and also subject to saturation effects, as I mentioned. So clearly many of these links are quite, value, quite valuable in the hundreds of millions of dollars per year. And this is averaged over a really long time period. So every that would be averaged out across that full time period uh, per year. Okay, next slide. And then I, we also want to make the point that there were very high values in 2021, obviously associated with winter storm Uri in Texas and uh, leading to really high interregional values into Texas. But uh, 2022 also had high interregional values through many regions in the country, not just into Texas. And so the high value, the values were particularly high in 2021, and those high values for transmission continued into 2022. Okay, next slide. And I, I don't want to dwell on the details of this slide too much, but a quick summary here is that the figures show the value for a set of links over time by region. And the main point here is that there's sort of a, a random or stochastic process going on. There's not a clear trend across the country. So there are high value years in different regions at different points of time. Although 2021 and 2022, which isn't shown in this particular figure, have particularly high values. It's not clear that that's the start of a, a long-term trend or not. It's just that the values are highly variable from year to year. Okay, next slide. Okay, we're gonna switch gears here to talk about how transmission varies by hour and looking in particular at high value hours. So next slide. We take two approaches, two, two different approaches to look at high value hours. And one, we have a set of events called designated events these are named weather events that have been identified in the literature, things you would have heard of in the news, such as winter storm Uri or polar vertex. But we also included days that were highlighted in NERC reports as grid stress days or grid stress hours as well. And um, we then the second approach we use is to look at the top 5% or top 10% of hours at each link in terms of value. So we just ranked the hours by their value. And then we looked at the top five or 10% of their hours. Okay, next slide. So this figure here shows the range of value, the, the value um, per top 5% or 10% or 1% for the value contained in the extreme weather events and the distribution shown here is the distribution across all the links that I showed in the map in the previous slide. And the little red line there is the median value. So the sort of median value link. And what we see is that the middle link, sort of the average link or the median link technically has 50% of the value contained in 5% of the hours. And on average, or in the median case, only about 10% of the value comes from those named weather events. And so there's a lot of value coming from rare, but not named or newsworthy weather events or um, that, that 
leads to overall value for these transmission links. So the point here is that the story is not just that it's extreme weather events, but there's other things that drive value for interregional transmission or even regional transmission. And those things include things like unexpected infrastructure outages or high net load demand or other periods like that. And as to what those exact conditions are is an area of active research for us. Okay, next slide. Um, and just to save on time here, I think I'll skip this slide and go to the next one after this. So the, there's an important question here is that can models represent this transmission value? Because so much of the value is tied up in these 5% these of hours, uh, it, it's a question of how well models can represent those sort of extreme or rare conditions. And pulling back for a second, there's uh, many, many analysis of transmissions, uh, transmission value really focuses on a subset of value rather than taking a broad multi-value perspective. So it's important, first of all, to take a broad multi-value perspective and include reliability benefits and the economic benefits that we're talking about here. Um, but when you do include the economic benefits, then it's also important to think about how well the models represent those benefits. So if we move on to the next slide, we can see that we looked at one example of a national model that's used for research purposes. And we compared the values between the transmission values found within that model and those found within empirical records. We found that the model values in this case were one third the empirical values um, for both regional and interregional transmission links. And we also found that a much smaller portion of total value in the model values is contained in the top of. Uh, 5% of most valuable hours. So in other words, the models are really not, or this particular model is not really representing sort of those extreme conditions which drive up the value of transmission links. Um, a few causes that, that might lead to this is having normalized weather profiles rather than representing the full weather variability, limited representation of infrastructure outages, and importantly, uh, if your model is deterministic si simulations, then it would have limited representation of uncertainty in real time conditions. And so that may be some of the difference here in this particular example. Again, we're also looking at um, additional models that are, are, this is a research based model that we looked at, but we are ongoing looking at models used in ac actual transmission planning studies. Okay, so finally, I just want to conclude on this last slide here. One more. So we found that many transmission links had substantial economic value from price arbitrage alone. This value is not evenly distributed across time. 50% of the value is contained in only 5% of the hours. This price arbitrage value, which we looked at in energy markets, it's similar to production cost savings, and that's typically considered to be about half of transmission's total value when looked at in multi-value studies. Transmission planners run the risk of underestimating these benefits if the models do not adequately account for these high value periods. And high value periods are not only due to extreme weather conditions, but are driven by other sort of more normal events uh, in frequent conditions, but that are not sort of named weather events, for example. Transmission values were particularly high in the last year and a half or so, and it's unclear yet whether this is the beginning of a longer term trend, upward trend in transmission value, or just continuing with the year to year variation we see in transmission value over time. Okay, and if we could skip two slides ahead here, just to the acknowledgments. I'll conclude. Um, thank you, everybody. Please feel free to reach out to me with questions. My email is listed here. 
and um, and I'd like to acknowledge everybody who helped make this presentation. Thank you, Dev, for that enlightening presentation. Um, I think it has set us up well to uh, have our first panel discussion. We welcome you to stay online and contribute um, to this first panel titled Determining the Need for and Benefits of Additional Interregional Transfer Capability. This panel will discuss whether existing processes adequately consider the need to establish a minimum requirement for interregional transfer capability between neighboring transmission planning regions. In addition, the panel will discuss whether there are drivers that necessitate the establishment of a minimum requirement. I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves, and they have the option to give initial opening remarks of three to five minutes. After that, we will begin a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, Michael Hill and I will each ask questions of the panel. If the panelists would like to answer a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Alternatively, if you are having issues with the raise hand function, please turn on your microphone and indicate that you would like to respond. Michael and I will call on panelists that indicate they would like to answer in turn. At that time, please turn on your microphone and respond to the question. When you have completed your answer, please turn off your microphone and lower your virtual hand in Zoom. We will reserve time at the end of the panel for the commissioners to ask questions. However, if a commissioner would like to ask a question during the discussion, we, use, we ask that they use the Zoom raise hand function as well. Michael and I will call on them in turn. We will keep track of time and we'll let the panelists or commissioners know when we need to move on. We'll now move to opening remarks. First, we have Neil Miller, Vice President of Infrastructure and Operations Planning at the California Independent System Operator. Please go ahead, Neil. Hello, and uh, th thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I have submitted a prepared statement, but I also wanted to touch on a few points in particular up front in these opening comments. First off, I wanted to indicate that the California ISO does count on, to a considerable extent, counts on interregional transmission capacity, and we do see, do see the need for that interregional capacity growing in the future. Currently, we have about 40,000 megawatts of non-simultaneous import capability, and about 16,000 of that is available to our load-serving entities for use in the state's re, uh, resource adequacy program. As well, we do see considerable growing needs associated with the projections of out-of-state wind development that we need to access to meet our energy and renewable energy goals. And we are already taking that into account in our current transmission planning process. Our 20-year outlook that helps set some longer-term context uh, indicated a need for up to 10 gigawatts of additional transfer capability over the next 20 years. Uh, second point is that we do have frameworks in place that help us achieve that transmission our, uh, within our current transmission planning processes. Besides our economic study processes, our policy-driven transmission framework is tied heavily to the state's resource planning efforts conducted by the appropriate state agencies. And that also can take into account more extreme event planning as part of that policy-driven transmission. That framework has produced additional transmission. Uh, in 2020, the first 500 kV line in some time to uh, Nevada went into service, the Harry L. El Dorado project, and the Delaney Colorado River 500 kV transmission project to Arizona is now moving to construction. Now, while we're working with our neighbors on interregional opportunities, there are some challenges stymieing some of the more productive conversations. Now, some of those challenges we have raised in particular with FERC notice of proposed rulemaking effort related to transmission planning, and those do tie heavily to cost allocation. We've also been supporting and developing a subscriber participating transmission owner model to help support uh, interregional transmission being developed by merchant transmission developers that would provide the subscribers the rights they're entitled to, but also provide the operating uh, streamlining advantages of having them inside the ISO balancing authority area. Now, against all that backdrop, we do see additional transmission being needed, and we do see processes needing to be enhanced in some areas. Now, but given our particular set of needs, the processes we have, as well as the issues that we're trying to address by improving some of those processes, I'm afraid we're not seeing a specific minimum interregional transmission capacity necessarily helping that conversation. 
we would be preferring to put more emphasis on the existing processes and addressing the challenges within those processes. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Neil. Next up, we have Dr. Liza Reed, Research Manager of Electricity Transmission at the Niskanen Center. Go ahead, Dr. Reed. Thank you so much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. The Niskanen Center is a 501c3 public policy organization with a strong interest in free markets, protecting America's property rights, and addressing climate change. And towards that end, among other things, we support policies for expanding interregional and high capacity electricity transmission. In my opening remarks, I will address a few of the questions posed by the commission. More data and details are available in the statement that I submitted previously and is now available online. The commission asked what current levels of transfer capacity are and if more is needed. Ms. Gannon had this same question this past summer. We engaged carbon impact consulting to help us address this. The data we found is provided in my pre-workshop statement based on mapping of transmission planning regions plus ERCOT onto a model of the grid provided by the Environmental Protection Agency. This is a model, but a well-regarded one that's intended to capture with re reasonable accuracy the workings of the grid. We found that most neighboring regions had less than five gigawatts of capacity with a few neighbors having zero gigawatts of capacity they could transfer. These small values represent less than 10% and often less than 5% of the peak load in each region. Dr. Adria Brooks' presentation after this panel presents some slightly different interconnection levels than what we found, and which I did want to note, but find similarly concerningly low levels of connectivity across most pairs. This is not a conflict in data, as we both use a model and an imperfect matching. And in fact, you can compare the maps in her presentation and our submitted statement, and you'll see how we differed in defining the regional boundaries based on the available model matching. <clears throat> The commission, commission also asked what drivers, what the drivers are for interregional capacity and if it's necessary for just and reasonable rates. <clears throat> we believe that reliability and resilience alone are sufficient reasons for more interregional transfer capacity. 15% is a pretty standard resource adequacy planning margin and should be considered a starting level for interregional transfer. As an engineer, I think about the difference between reliability and resilience and that resilience is what's left when reliability fails. So increasing interregional transfer is a reliability action because it extends how far the reliability of a system can go before it hits the wall of required resilience measures. There's ample evidence from the last few years alone that interregional transfer keeps the lights on and saves lives. Market access is an additional <clears throat> relevant driver in organized markets, but non-RTO regions would still benefit from being able to import and export power in cases of extreme weather and other unexpected electricity crises. Interregional transfer capabilities must be expanded to ensure ratepayers are not on the hook for high prices due to myop myopic thinking and planning. Panelists later in this workshop and the presentation we just saw from Deb Milstein will demonstrate the broad economic benefits of more interregional capacity, and in particular, how traditional planning and modeling fails to capture this benefit, and thus why it is important for FERC to move forward with establishing a minimum interregional requirement. I'll finally quickly conclude with some comments on the definition of interregional. The workshop predefined regions as transmission planning regions. There are limitations and complications to this definition. One is who it leaves out, of course, the majority of Texans. I encourage the commission to consider ways in which ERCOT can be consulted and involved in a minimum transfer requirement that does not leave the good people of Texas out in the cold again. The other is the issue of regions with a large geographic footprint and unequal distribution of transfer capacity. In my pre-workshop statement, I share some data from our model estimates on the connectivity of the MISO North region to neighboring SPP and CERC compared to MISO South just as an example to illustrate one of these issues of, compl of complicated definitions. The commission should consider how it will require regions to ensure their interregional capacity is not a check the box, but an actual capability available to all consumers in the region. This consideration ties to the questions facing future panels about cost allocation, and I look forward to hearing their discussion. This is a complex topic that requires careful consideration, but action is necessary. I encourage the commission to undertake a rulemaking on interregional planning and include a minimum transfer requirement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liza. Next up, we have Christina Hayes, Executive Director of Americans for a Clean Energy Grid, 
please go ahead, Christina. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you for holding this workshop and for inviting me to speak on this important topic. My name is Christina Hayes, and I am Executive Director of Americans for a Clean Energy Grid. ASEG re represents a diverse coalition of participants supporting high-capacity transmission in order to reliably and cost-effectively support the grid for the future. Participants include clean energy customers, labor unions, environmental organizations, and traditional and merchant transmission developers. I look forward to engaging in dialogue with the other speakers on today's panel. Briefly, it is important to note that recent evidence shows that interregional transmission is necessary and is not being planned in either sufficient capacity or at a sufficient rate. Others have spoken to the need for greater interregional transmission as shown by various reliability incidents. I want to show the need for advanced planning, specifically noting that the Transmission Agency of Northern California recently stated it takes an average of 13 years to plan and build a transmission line. Lauren Azar recently testified before this commission that it takes eight to 10 years. And one utility in the West recently broke ground on a transmission line that took 15 years to site and permit. With lines that take such a uh, long lead time, uh, the focus on what minimum amount is necessary to ensure just and reasonable rates should in fact be broader. The commission should set a floor, but also provide a methodology for regions to continually examine how to meet their needs for interregional transmission. As the resource mix changes for a variety of reasons and electrification needs grow, we need to plan the grid for what it will be, not for what it has been. As I like to say, I need to buy clothes for the size my son is going to be, not the size that he used to be. Additionally, the need is just as strong in non-RTO regions as they are in organized markets. And it must be done as a complement to effective regional planning to ensure that imported energy can be delivered to where it is needed. Determining the precise formula and methodology is difficult and may require significant regional flexibility, but the answer can't be nothing. We strongly support uh, the commission and their support um, is critical for making it happen and we support a rulemaking on this topic. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Christina. Next up, we have Michelle Quito, who is a supervisor in the electric market design section at the California Public Utilities Commission. Please go ahead, Michelle. Good afternoon, commissioners and fellow panelists. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Michelle Quito, and I'm the program manager in the energy division at the CPUC. The CPUC has a statutory mandate to represent the interests of California customers throughout uh, proceedings at the FERC. And it's in this capacity that I'm here today. I have a few comments that address the questions raised for the panels today. First, I'd like to briefly touch on the regional transfer capability from regions to California. Given that California has historically been import dependent, we have robust transfer capability both to the Northwest and the Southwest. The operating transfer capability is about 44,000 megawatts or over 40,000 as Neil Millar said. Although the maximum import cap capability is less given that we need to ensure that internal generation is deliverable to load in California. The maximum import capability is closer to 15,000 megawatts and that compares to California's peak load of 52,000 megawatts, which was set this past September. Second, I'd like to talk about minimum standards for transfer capability that are currently be being considered in light of extreme weather events across the country and in the West this past summer. In this regard, it's important to keep in mind that transfer capability is only helpful to the extent that there is generation available to transfer. With respect to California, three items are important to note. First, grid reliability events in California and throughout the West primarily occur when there is a westwide heat wave with elevated loads throughout the entire region, precisely the time when additional transfer capability over and above what we currently have would not likely help because there wouldn't be generation available for California to import from the Southwest or Northwest during such periods. In this regard, I would note that the transmission lines at the time of greatest stress this past summer were not fully loaded. Second, teeing off of what was just discussed by LBNL, you can see that the economic benefits of additional transfer capability in the West are relatively low, which is consistent with the notion that we currently have robust transfer capability. Third, there are some thoughts of the California in the West that, that California in the West should expand further east. Here I'd like to note that it depends on what resources we are connecting to and the availability of those resources, as well as the fact that long line transmission has its own vulnerabilities, as we saw in July of 2021 with the large, 
loss of a large transmission capability from the Northwest due to, due to the bootleg fire. Thus, these types of transmission projects should be considered carefully based on the facts and circumstances in each region. In addition, I would note that transmission is expensive. Since 2008, the Collective Commission Jurisdictional Transmission Rate Base for California's three largest transmission owners has increased from $4.6 billion to $22.4 billion in their draft 2023 transmission owner rate case filings. Further, since 2009, CAISO's high voltage transmission access charge has increased from 383 per megawatt hour to 1639, an increase of 328%, while gross load in California during that time frame has declined by 8.6%. Further, the CAISO is projecting 30.5 billion in new transmission costs in its 20-year outlook with specific consideration of, without specific consideration of increasing interregional transfer capability. Transmission also has environmental impacts, thus should be considered holistically by each region to address their specific needs. Finally, just a co comment about cost causation and cost allocation. To the extent that the commission moves in this direction and mandates minimum standards that necessitate new transmission to address extreme weather events and allocates those to a certain group of customers, the commission should ensure that the customers are provided priority access to the new transmission during stress system conditions. I would also like to make clear that these represent the views of CPUC Energy Division staff and do not represent the views of the CPUC in its entirety or individual commissioners. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Next up, we have Philip Moeller, who is the Executive Vice President at the Edison Electric Institute. Please go ahead, Phil. Well, thank you, Mr. Martin, and greetings to the commissioners and the staff. Thank you for having Edison Electric Institute as part of this panel today. Um, I'm going to state something that's probably pretty obvious. Uh, EEI is the Association of Investor-Owned Electric Companies. In the United States, we operate in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, serving 235 million Americans, trying to make the system as clean as we can, as fast as we can, but keeping affordability and reliability front and center. EEI member companies have a variety of business models. I think everybody knows that, but that's pretty essential as we talk about this entire topic. We have members that are wires only companies. We have those that are vertically integrated. Some are in RTOs and some are not. In preparation for this panel, I went back and many of us were at the July 20th meeting of the Joint Task Force between FERC and NARU. I rewatched that. And it was interesting to see the regional differences that were reflected by particularly state commissioners that were reflective, again, of the different business models that EEI member companies have. Most people were generally very supportive of uh, more uh, transfer capacity between regions. Uh, not universally, though, although the details were a little bit limited. Uh, there were regions, though, that were, were quite skeptical and uh, concerned that it would not necessarily lead to a more efficient and possibly even a more complicated system. Some pointed out this can already be done without FERC action, depending on how uh, interested the parties are. And Commissioner Phillips brought out the fact that he had talked to people who uh, were in different regions and they can agree to sit down and work through potentially more transfer capacity but the problem comes when you start defining the benefits because the benefits are defined differently by different states. And so when you can't define the benefits, it's hard to then go to the cost allocation and things don't get done. So perhaps the commission, uh, not going toward a standard approach, but can focus on uh, figuring out how those benefits can be defined uh, more broadly, or at least in a more defined way that allows for state differences. There are regions, and I'm sure you'll hear from some later today, that feel that they have sufficient accountability already through their IRP process, and again, are concerned that this could lead uh, to, to policies that actually restrict or complicate the additional uh, transfer capacity being developed. A couple other observations from that July 20th hearing. I think uh, the Utah Commission made a point that the 
The West has a long way to go, but is making a lot of progress already in terms of dealing with these regional issues. The former chair of the Arkansas Commission, uh, Chair Tom, has pointed out, maybe the FERC should focus on, on the seams issues first, as opposed to larger issues, because those are the low-hanging fruit. And as uh, Dr. Reed pointed out earlier, these are very complicated issues. The fact patterns are going to be very different in each uh, in each situation, whether it's uh, the flows or the contractual arrangements. And as Ms. Keto pointed out, you have to have the resources there to transfer them. Uh, and so that as, as we deal with the resource adequacy issues, uh, that's a major factor as well. Thank you again for having me. And I look forward to answering any questions and the discussion of the topics. Thank you very much, Phil. Next up, we have Trisha Pridemore, Chair of the Georgia Public Service Commission. Please go ahead, Chair Pridemore. Good afternoon. My name is Trisha Pridemore, and I am proud to serve the citizens of the state of Georgia on the Georgia Public Service Commission. I'm also proud to serve my fellow commissioners who are also elected statewide as their chairman. Thank you for this invitation to be a panelist on this FERC staff-led workshop. In addressing today's topic of determining the need for additional interregional transfer capability, let me start by saying non-RTO states do not need an independent transmission monitor or a minimum interregional transfer capability requirement. And the forthcoming facts demonstrate that Georgia is an example to follow, not replace. Existing state and FERC processes and rules have already been established and they work. The Federal Power Act expressly reserves resource IRP planning to the states, including transmission. In Georgia, we have a robust IRP process driven by short and long-term planning research, hearings, and commission-driven decisions. Before transmission plans come to the PSC, GITS, the Georgia Inter Integrated Transmission System parties including the vertically integrated investor-owned utility, the system operator for our 41 electric co-ops, and the action agency for our 49 municipal electric companies, build plans and monthly meetings, and all are active in CERTEP, the Southeastern Regional Planning Processes, whose 14 members provide intra and interstate collaboration. With NERC CERT guidance, our bottom-up approach maintains reliability and does not put effort pressure on rates by constructing unnecessary or duplicative transmission assets. This level of collaboration is a hallmark of Southeastern utilities. From utilities mutual assistance network that responds to restore systems after hurricanes and other weather outages to these coordination agencies that keep nasty cost allocation, load balancing and siting disagreements at bay Georgia is better for maintaining a safe, reliable, affordable system, all while not being told to do so from a top-down governance structure. In a case of emergency load transfer, the capacity benefit margin, the CBM, which is part of the existing OATT compliance filings, is already established to address set-asides of transmission transfer capability. A minimum ITC requirement may be right for an RTO state, but the processes, rules, and collaboration I've outlined demonstrate there isn't a need in a non-RTO state, such as Georgia, where for the ninth year in a row, we've been named the number one state to do business. We're tied for number one in energy with electric rates below the national average. We've put $6 billion in our rainy day fund in just the last eight years and created over 1 million new private sector jobs, including the two new largest electric vehicle plants in the United States. We've done all this without a blackout, brownout, or forced curtailment, all with a strong economy with year-over-year -year growth. Integrated resource planning works, and I look forward to today's discussion with all the panelists. Thank you very much, Chair Pridemore. Lastly, we have Simon Mahan, who is the Executive Director of the Southern Renewable Energy Association. Please go ahead, Simon. Good afternoon, commissioners and staff. 
my name is Simon Mahan. I'm the executive director of the Southern Renewable Energy Association. SRIA is a nonprofit trade association of large scale wind, solar, energy storage, and transmission developers focused on promoting renewable energy solutions in the Southeast. For the past decade, I have focused on state and regional regulatory proceedings in the Southeast regarding renewable energy issues, including many integrated resource plans while also playing active stakeholder roles in transmission planning at the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, MISO, the Southwest Power Pool, SPP, and the Southeastern Regional Transmission Planning Processes, or CERTEP. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today to represent a viewpoint of RTO and non-RTO regions, in addition to providing a Southern stakeholder perspective regarding the interregional transmission planning processes. Within recent memory, Winter Storm Uri was the worst storm event in decades and will remain a focus of our industry for years. And while Texas and the Great Plains bore the brunt of the storm, the Southeast was not untouched. Unforced generator outages in CERC, exacerbated by transmission constraints in CERC, contributed to power outages into MISO South and power outages into SPP. Without the investigations of MISO, FERC, and NERC into Winter Storm Uri, the problems in CERC would have never come to light. If better interregional transfer capacity had existed from CERC into MISO South and from MISO South into SPP, perhaps the regions could have better, better weathered the storm better. Beyond the previous storms and investigations that followed, much of the non-RTO South has limited to no publicly available data on an hour by hour and location specific operations in the region, making it nearly impossible for stakeholders and regulators to show the economic value associated with better transmission planning. Data transparency for stakeholders regarding economic transmission planning is almost entirely absent in the non-RTO Southeast. Without data transparency, it is unclear how interregional transmission planning or cost allocation could ever occur. At MISO meetings, I've often heard that today's economic transmission project are tomorrow's reliability project. What this means is that in transmission planning, we often underestimate the reliability benefits associated with economic, economic transmission projects. However, the non-RTO Southeast effectively has no economic transmission planning process, compounding the problem. The CERTEP process uses a single economic benefit metric avoided transmission costs, while not calculating other well-established ec economic benefit metrics like adjusted production cost, avoided capital costs of local resource investments, reduced resource adequacy requirements, and avoided risk of load shedding. CERTEP also relies on a 10-year time horizon to evaluate the single ben benefit, even though many large-scale interregional transmission projects would have a useful lifetime many decades into the future. By only evaluating a single benefit metric and restricting the time horizon to 10 years, the CERTEP process is constructed in a fashion so that it is unlikely that any transmission project would ever overcome a benefit to cost ratio and be approved to be constructed. Meanwhile, MISO's long range transmission planning processes are much more robust, including multiple scenarios, multiple benefits metrics, and examine value over a 20 to 40 year horizon. In order to develop interregional projects and improve interregional transfer capacity, both CERTEP and MISO would need to work diligently together on such a process. However, as I'm a stakeholder in both of those processes, I see no such process. I see no such progress on either front. Synchronizing transmission planning processes across the Southeast to create interregional transmission capacity necessitates standardized transmission planning rules across the country for RTO and non-RTO regions alike. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, and thank you to all of our panelists for their opening statements. We're now gonna to turn to the question and answer portion of today's panel. Uh, my co-moderator, Michael Hill, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you, Andrew. Um, so to kick off this Q&A portion of the panel, uh, we'd like to start with a, a discussion of um, where we are currently in terms of the amount of interregional transfer capability 
Um, and I know Liza Reed, you you touched on this in your um, in your opening statement. So I think we'll uh, turn to you first to answer this question to to elaborate um, on anything you'd like to. Uh, but then after Liza's remarks, we'd love to hear from other panelists as well. Um, but Liza, our, our first question is: What are the current levels of interregional transfer capability between transmission planning regions, and is more interregional transfer capability needed between transmission planning regions? Why or why not? Uh, so, anything you'd like to elaborate on? Uh, please go ahead, Liza. Thank you so much, Michael. This is difficult to discuss without a map, but I did submit some maps uh, in my statement, and they're available online. And I encourage folks to check them out. Uh, in terms of how we think about available interregional transfer capacity, again, these numbers are based on a model from um, Environmental Protection Agency's integrated planning um, model. But our estimates show that there are some regions that have a very low interregional uh, transfer capability. Of course, ERCOT, unsurprisingly, less than a gigawatt of transfer capability, which represents 1% of ERCOT's peak load. Now, uh, I think another one of my panelists mentions that peak loads were set this this summer in a number of regions. So the peak load that I'm referring to is actually pre-2022. It's the 2021 um, peak load for all of these regions. So these numbers are already a little off uh, due to some heat waves this past summer. Um, but so there's 1% between ERCOT and SPP, um, an estimated uh, 2 gigawatts between SPP and CERT. Uh, which is 4% of SPP's load, only 2% of CERT's load. Uh, Florida isolated with um, just 4 gigawatts of transfer capacity between Florida and CERT. ISO New England similarly isolated just 2.5 gigawatts between um, New York and New England. That's 8% of New York's peak load and about 10% of ISO New England's load. It's not all bad news. Some of these planning regions do have a high amount of transfer capability. Uh, between Northern Grid and West Connect, there's about 10 gigawatts of transfer capability. I believe some of our other panelists mentioned connectivity between uh, California and Northern Grid and West Connect. Um, and those, those connections represent 8% of Cal ISO's load um, to West Connect and 12% of the peak load from Northern Grid. This is taking out the non-planning regions um, like LAPW and BANC. So those are just some numbers to kind of throw out there, but we're looking for across most of these pairs um, at less, definitely less than 15% across everything except Northern Grid and West Connect and less than 10% of the peak load of the higher region um, across most of the other pairs. Okay, great. Thank you. That's a uh, very helpful context for us to kick off this discussion. Um, would anyone else like to comment on the um, current level of interregional transfer capability and whether there is a need uh, to increase um, interregional transfer capability? Um, and the uh, if you do have comments, please you know raise your hand in the Zoom uh, in the Zoom um, function. Uh, otherwise, I am particularly interested in. I know um, Neil and Michelle, you you both spoke to that Western perspective. If you have anything to add. Um, about uh, you know Kaiso's experience and, and whether there is a need uh, for additional transfer uh, capability into Kaiso and what if anything is driving uh, that transfer capability. So I, I see Neil's hand raised. So uh, why don't we go to Neil and then we'll go to uh, Phil after that. So Neil, please go ahead. Well, thank you for that. And yes, uh, I think our point is that we do see the need for additional transmission capacity. That is part of our longer term 20 year outlook vision as well. Uh, I think the question is how to get there and how we pick which of the transmission projects that are needed. And our focus, we realize, is perhaps somewhat more unique compared to the, the issues we're hearing about in the Eastern Interconnect, and that might mean uh, a different set of solutions. But uh, we definitely are relying on interregional transmission and do see a growing need, as I mentioned in my opening comments. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Neil. Um, so why don't, uh, Phil, did you have any additional comments? I saw your, your hand was raised. Please Just go a ahead. quick point. On Friday, I spoke to Claire Moeller, most of you know who he is with MISO, and he said, the reason we were able to get 14 gigawatts out of PJM during Words of Story Uri is because I have close to 400 connections there. 
And that gives some perspective as to what we're dealing with. His point being, you know, one transmission line is not going to fix this issue. That's it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next, I see we have uh, Christina has her hand raised. So why don't we turn to Christina and then after that, uh, Simon. So Christina, please go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I was uh, really interested in the discussion about the bootleg fire in 2021 and the impact it had on transmission in the West. Uh, most notably, it reduced it reduced the import capacity uh, from the Pacific Northwest into California by 90 percent. Uh, so something like four four. 4,800 megawatt import capacity was reduced to 428 megawatts. So, the, and that reduction is something like, was like something like 10% of CAISO's peak load at the time. So it resulted in uh, a very tenuous situation in the West. Um, and that's where I think that having additional transmission to provide a sort of insurance policy in cases um, such as that fire and other circumstances would be really helpful. The effects were in fact cascading around the West because uh, to the extent that California was able to import from the Northwest or was not in that case, then it could not in turn export to the Southwest. And so it also uh, resulted in shortages in the Southwestern part of the United States. So ensuring that there are additional lines in case of emergency circumstances would uh, help support reliability throughout a region. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Um, and next, I see Simon's hand raised as well. Please go ahead, Simon. Yeah, I just wanted to flag, um, you know, part of the reason why we didn't submit data on this was because, frankly, it's it's really difficult to find specific megawatt numbers regarding the transfer capacity from CERTEP into the FRCC, into PJM, into uh, MISO South, into MISO North. Um, and into the South Carolina planning processes. In order to get access to that data, you have to go to the, through the CERTEP uh, CEII access process. And in order to do that, you have to pay an application fee uh, to Southern Company, and then you have to pay a, uh, an additional um, cost for Southern Company to conduct a background check on you, which may include uh, pulling a credit check and uh, for Southern Company to do to, to, uh, some sort of private investigation on you. Um, and so there's additional uh, data concerns and uh, the ability for stakeholders to uh, even be able to understand the, the existing infrastructure and connections with our neighbors. Um, but then I think as you saw uh, Dr. Milstein's presentation, there was a big gap of, of data in the Southeast. Um, and so there's, there's really, um, a, a limitation to be able to understand what the value could be down here in the Southeast simply because the data aren't available or the data aren't being collected. Okay, great. Yeah, that is a uh, helpful context, Simon. Um, I see uh, Chair Pridemore has her hand raised. Why don't we go to you next, Chair Pridemore? Thank you. I, I recognize that from uh, when the agenda was sent, uh, there's been a speaker switch. We've we've had one speaker off this uh, reduced on this panel, and then we've had a uh, Mr. Mahan, uh, who I know from Georgia, is now on the panel. Um, for the sake of disclosure, though, anything related to cost and rates uh, cannot be discussed. We have a uh, we are under ex parte right now in a Georgia Power rate case. Mr. Mahan represents an intervener in that case. Okay, thank you for that uh, word of caution. I'm much appreciated. Um, any additional comments on this kind of intro high level question uh, before we start uh, diving deeper into how current processes consider transfer capability um, and what's driving uh, a need for increased transfer capability? Uh, any other kind of intro high level remarks? All right, I don't see any other hands raised, so I'll turn it back over to my um, co-moderator, Andrew, uh, to continue with the, with the questioning. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Um, so now I'm gonna turn to our second question, which I'm gonna be, I think, initially turning to you, Neil, um, because you mentioned in your opening remarks some transmission projects that actually have been developed. So the question is the potential need for additional interregional transfer capability currently considered in any transmission planning processes, and if so, how? 
and to the extent such needs are considered, have they resulted in the development of any transmission facilities? So, Neil, I'd like to at least get your initial thoughts on that. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, two 500 kV transmission projects had been already approved by the ISO. Uh, that predated the current interregional transmission planning coordination framework set, under, set up under FERC Order 1000. Uh, those projects were initially rationalized and depended on the economic benefits they provided. And as they started to move through after the ISO approval, uh, they also started to accrue more uh, policy-driven transmission project benefit in terms of providing access to additional renewable generation. So after the initial approval, the need for the projects actually grew and also transitioned into a heavy policy-driven component. And uh, those are the two main mechanisms for us to consider interregional transmission, our economic study process, as well as when I refer to policy-driven transmission, that is essentially where the state's resource planning requirements get factored in uh, to take those requirements into account. So we do have those two vehicles. Uh, we do see that our economic study process considers uh, a relatively broad range of economic studies. Currently, we're only approving projects that we see the need to at least start within the 10 years, but we're doing our economic studies we do look out much longer than 10 years to, to test the economic benefits against the cost. So I hope that helps provide some context. It does, thank you very much. Um, and as a reminder, if any other panelists would like to speak on this, please just raise your hand. Um, I'd like to actually go to Simon now, okay? Yeah, um, so the, the question being, is it, is it taken into consideration um, with other processes? And uh, with my experience with MISO, you know, MISO does have these, these IPSAC, the Interregional Planning um, Subcommittees uh, between PJM and, and SPP. And those meetings uh, historically have, have had some limited success. Um, MISO is currently going through um, a, a joint task force regarding uh, interconnection along the SPP and MISO seam. Um, that is seeing uh, some limited value and seeing some transmission projects being proposed out of that process. Um, that's not quite what we're talking about here within our regional projects. And so I don't want folks to, to uh, take the, uh, uh, the JTIQ process as um, the end all be all that, uh, that I think we're meant to be discussing here. Um, but then compared to what, what uh, MISO conducts with the, IPS, uh, the IPSAC processes and stakeholders uh, that it currently has, there is basically nothing like that with CERTEP. Uh, if you go into the CERTEP website and you look on um, just on the main page, they do have a drop down menu for interregional processes for um, the Florida Reliability Council, for MISO, for, for the South Carolina Regional Transmission Planning Processes. But if you click on each one of those and you, you click on the committee portals for stakeholders, each one of those links comes up with a 404 broken error. Um, so there is not a way for currently stakeholders to join in on interregional planning processes between CERTEP the Florida Reliability Council, MISO, or South Carolina. Um, if you pull up the SPP and PJM connections with CERTEP, um, you end up on a landing page that is to generic uh, planning sites between those RTOs. Um, and so there, there's really no IPSAC equivalent between SPP or between CERTEP and the rest of the RTOs. And then if you go further into CERTEP, and, and you dig around and, and look at how CERTEP conducts its, its quote unquote regional uh, transmission planning processes, um, they have something called the attachment N1. And N1 describes how uh, interregional transmission gets planned within CERTEP with its surrounding bodies. And it is almost exactly how regional transmission planning gets done within CERTEP, where there's a single transmission benefit evaluated. And that's where, uh, quote, total avoided costs of projects included in the regional transmission plan that would be displaced um, if the proposed interregional transmission project was included. Um, and again, that's over a 10-year time horizon. 
Um, and so you're not including a wide variety of benefits. Um, and so really you have to fix the regional transmission planning process in CERTEP first in order to get to the interregional transmission planning processes fixes within CERTEP. Um, and then you've got states like Mississippi, uh, Kentucky, North Carolina, uh, that are both in RTO and non-RTO regions that have different benefit metrics that look over different time horizons. Um, and I will also just mention that uh, I, I am in many of these states that, that have RTO or that have uh, integrated resource planning processes, and I can confidently say that interregional transmission capacity does not come up as a topic of discussion uh, or modeling um, for these integrated resource plans. It, integrated resource planning uh, historically is is focused only on generation uh, additions or retirements in a particular state. Uh, and not across state lines. And that's where the interregional transmission capacity um, is, is where a CERTEP or an RTO type process should be conducting that type of analysis. And that type of analysis just does not take place in any of the IRPs that, that I've been involved in throughout the Southeast. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Simon. Um, Chair Pridemore, um, we'll turn to you now. So I, I want to highlight one of the things that Georgia has done this year. Uh, in Georgia Power's 2022 Integrated Resource Plan, uh, which passed the commission back in July, uh, we passed as part of that the North Georgia Reliability and Resilience Plan. Uh, it, it, it's part of a, a larger effort in transmission where our staff, commissioners, and the Georgia Power Company have been involved in trying to increase the quantity of renewables in the state. Once all of the renewable energy uh, that was approved in that 2022 IRP, and then previously in the last three IRPs, uh, all comes online, will be number four in the nation uh, in, in, uh, in solar energy. And so one of the challenges that we've seen is as solar developers look to try to uh, come into the state and, and get the least cost real estate that's available to them, that's most likely in South Georgia. Uh, in, in agriculture country, but the load is in North Georgia, in and around Atlanta. And so the purpose behind this North Georgia uh, resilience plan is to really site out transmission throughout the state to determine uh, what really the needs are and how we can serve that load in Atlanta. As a portion of that North Georgia plan, uh, there is a good amount of interest of in interstate uh, planning as well. And so uh, that is all part of the IRP process. I encourage those parties that are interested in how transmission and cost allocations are, are determined in Georgia uh, to intervene in our cases. Uh, we, uh, like I said, we're under uh, ex parte in the rate case, uh, but we'll do another IRP and rate case three years from now. Thank you very much, Chair Pardmore. And yes, we are unfortunately very familiar with <laughs> how inconvenient ex parte can be in these types of discussions. Um, let's turn next to Michelle. Sorry, uh, this is Michelle Quito. So I just wanted to address the uh, interregional uh, transmission in the context of integrated resource planning. And I just want to say for at least California and the CAISO, we and the CPUC that uh, does the integrated resource planning process, we do consider out-of-state uh, wind um, and a number we consider offshore wind. We consider in-state resources, and we definitely consider out-of-state wind in our integrated resource planning process. Um, I did want to address the comment about, um, you know, the outage of the bootleg, boot, bootleg fire. Um, so it, it, you do build transmission, in, in my mind, not just for redundancy, but also to access resources. And it would be a very expensive proposition to have a redundant line going up to up to up to the north um, to protect against those uh, those outages, um, you know one of the issues there was that uh, the um, it wasn't necessarily over the entire day. It was really that um, it wasn't being considered in the the, the market processes, um, but that's sort of another matter. Um, I also want to say um, when we do consider these long line transmissions. Um, 
you really do have to think um, what you're building to. Um, so for example, the Southwest used to be sort of resource rich and is uh, less resource rich now. Um, and MISO is um, less research resource rich now. So I think that um, at least from California's perspective, we do want to consider transmission and generation um, simultaneously, not just transmission alone. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Um, thank you for all those comments. Um, do any other panelists want to speak to this topic? Seeing no additional hands, I'm going to turn it back over to Michael. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, for our next question, I believe I'll uh, first direct it to Christina. I believe you have some thoughts about this. Um, and the question is, what are the drivers of the need for increasing interregional transfer capability? Um, it seems like we've heard uh, kind of different perspectives uh, throughout the panel so far on, um, you know, extreme weather being a driver, um, economics or certain, you know, preferred certain types of resources out of state being a driver. Um, so any thoughts you have on what those drivers are? Do um, drivers uh, of the need for increased interregional transfer capability, do they vary based on regional or system characteristics? And are there any barriers to identifying or assessing those drivers? Um, so any thoughts you have, Christina, please go ahead. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Uh, mostly, I wanted to focus on a little bit of myth busting, just because often the uh, myth that is out there is that transmission is needed for public policy reasons, that renewables are a bit of a niche uh, product and, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, um, and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I did a little bit of digging um, in terms of the resource mix that is changing. Um, the statistics are something like 83% of customers are currently served by a utility with a carbon reduction target. Um, the Clean Energy Buyers Association has a tracker that shows uh, corporate power purchase agreements and other procurement mechanisms. In 2016, there was something like 1.5 gigawatts of clean energy that was procured. In 2021, it was more than 11 gigawatts. Uh, so that's about a tenfold increase over five years, six years, and includes standbys such as McDonald's, Pepsi, Dow Chemical, and Johnson & Johnson. So clean energy procurement is rising. Uh, moving to renewables is good for business in a lot of ways. Um, so the uh, integration of renewables for, on a cost-effective and reliable basis is here to stay and continues to be important. Uh, additionally, increased use of electrification uh, is, is growing. So there was a 2015 study by the U.S. Energy Information Association showing that residential energy consumption has increased um, something like 57% uh, between 1980 and 2009. And uh, electricity direct use by all sectors increased more than tenfold since 1950. So to meet these changing characteristics, uh, additional energy resources are going to be needed, as well as additional transmission to deliver it to load. Uh, wanted to also address, I am so glad that there's somebody to spar with on uh, issues in the West. Um, and so I wanted to raise the issue of uh, transmission throughout the West, helping on a regional and interregional basis uh, between Northern Grid, West Connect, and KISO can help supplement some of the uh, challenges that came up around the bootleg fire. I think that uh, Wyoming wind, uh, other resources throughout the rest of the West are considered a uh, strong complement to the solar in California and the Southwest. And certainly uh, significant transmission is going to be needed to deliver it to load. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Christina. Um, do any of the other panelists have uh, uh, reactions to Christina's comments or um, or thoughts on you know what really is driving the need for um, interregional transfer capability? Uh, Simon, I see you have your hand raised. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. In, in addition, um, so throughout the southeast, of course, we have hurricanes. Um, we have tornadoes. In 2021, um, we of course had winter storm Uri. Um, there was Hurricane Ida that took out a significant amount of transmission capability in, in Louisiana. Um, there was a, a very significant tornado outbreak that destroyed the uh, single transmission uh, line that connects MISO North and MISO South, the, the one firm transmission connection between the North and the South. Um, but we're seeing additional threats. 
Um, just yesterday, uh, I think folks who have been paying attention to the, the news saw the attack on two substations in North Carolina, and now we have power outages in Moore County, North Carolina. Um, so we're seeing different uh, physical threats to the existing infrastructure. We're seeing changes in the generation mix. Uh, uh, Chair Pridemore talked about the North uh, Georgia Reliability Plan. Uh, part of that is the retirement of coal units uh, in the northern part of the state, in addition to uh, addition of, of solar resources in the southern part of the state. Um, and to Christina's point, it's it's without mandates. Uh, there, there are no renewable portfolio standards, no public policy requirements in the state of Georgia. It's all based on economics. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll mention uh, regarding barriers, some of the states in the southeast, we have no integrated resource planning process. Uh, Florida and Alabama do not have public, uh, public service commission processes to review integrated resource plans. Um, there's no stakeholder process, there's no docket um, where integrated resource plans are filed or reviewed. And uh, I think um, uh, maybe it was Michelle who mentioned that they evaluate uh, out-of-state wind or out-of-state resources. I, I do want to flag that it is um, unusual for uh, an out-of-state resource uh, in an integrated resource plan to specifically identify a transmission route whenever you're evalu quote unquote evaluating an out-of-state uh, wind resource. I've been in integrated resource planning processes where those resources, uh, out-of-state wind resources may be evaluated simply by tacking on an additional transmission cost. And in, in this type of discussion, um, that is not sufficient. Uh, there are integrated resource plans that I'm currently part of um, where MISO is aggregated into an entirely uh, copper sheet. Um, and then uh, out-of-state wind is then uh, evaluated as an additional cost. Um, that is not the same as robustly evaluating uh, interregional transmission capacity. And so I think it's important that we be clear in our language when talking about integrated resource planning and how robust those processes are um, and how useful IRPs actually are in evaluating what they are evaluating and what they're not actually evaluating. Thank you. Okay, great, Simon. Uh, and I see that we have a, a couple more hands raised. Um, so we'll go to Liza next. And then after that, we'll follow with Neil. So please go ahead, Liza. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly underscore and synthesize a couple of points, primarily those made by uh, Christina Hayes, and then also respond to some other remarks. As Christina noted in a series of her comments this afternoon, the generation and load mixes are changing and transmission necessarily, how we think about transmission necessarily needs to change. And because it takes quite a bit of time to build a transmission line, it should be on the leading edge of that. One of the reasons that I encourage the commission to undertake a rulemaking on interregional transmission capacity um, is that it is actually quite narrow, but creates a certainty around which these other complexities can then manage. So former chairman Mueller, of course, noted that there are complex differences between regions, between utilities, between RTOs and non-RTOs, and I respect and understand those differences. And I think the minimum transfer capacity approach allows FERC to address reliability and resilience concerns very explicitly in a way that supports consumers, both from a cost perspective and from, quite frankly, a lights on perspective, um, while, while still leaving many of um, the complex differences in business models and planning um, it in place and, and regional differences respected. And I'll also note, um, I believe it was Ms. Keto who mentioned that weather does not happen in isolation, but rather happens in, in very large regions. Of, of course, this is accurate. There, the presentation by Dev Milstein and then later work by panelists from GE Consulting, I think nicely illustrate that while this is true, there is still value found in interregional transmission, even when those regions are experiencing similar weather. And during that California heat wave, California was able to import 
power to support their load and did not have to do rolling blackouts. Obviously, there was demand response as well in place there, but there was certainly in a regional transfer capacity that they were able to lean on, despite the fact that that heat wave was widespread. Similarly, as we saw in winter storm Uri, that cold snap was hitting other regions as well, and they were able to move that power. Uh, so I appreciate the point. I think there's a lot of benefits to how transmission can actually be a value, even when all places with those transmission lines are still experiencing extreme weather. Okay, great. That's helpful, Liza. Thank you. Um, Neil, did you have uh, uh, comments as well? Yes, thank you. Uh, there were a few points I just wanted to follow up with on. One is that, yes, we did indicate that we believe our, uh, our coordination process with the state agencies has been very effective on transmission, coordinated transmission resource planning, and it gives us a good jumping off point for conversations uh, ac across the West. Um, I didn't want to suggest, however, that the interregional process itself is going well. We do see that there are issues there that need to be addressed because the current interregional coordination process has not actually been effective in helping engage in those meaningful conversations on some of these interregional projects. And those were some of the challenges I mentioned that we we're seeking to get addressed through our participation in the one for NOPR process. Now, setting that aside, I think the other paradigm shift we all have to adjust to uh, California may be admittedly one of the more aggressive in its transition to renewable generation, but it's certainly not alone. And as the fleets across the West are evolving, we see the transmission planning and the resource planning needing to happen in a coordinated fashion, as opposed to perhaps the way some of the past transmission development worked, where it had the luxury of waiting until resources were developed and then capturing the economic opportunities of building additional transmission. For us, with the pace we see needing to move to in the future, we do need to have those working more effectively in lockstep, not only within California, but across the West. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Neil. And uh, I guess before we turn to Phil, if I could ask a quick follow-up question, Neil, I was, I believe you mentioned earlier um, the idea of whether to have a, a, a new separate process or to, you know, um, incrementally improve the existing like order 1000 interregional coordination processes. Um, I guess if, uh, do you have any thoughts on, you know, in an ideal world, uh, would um, a process to get additional transfer, interregional transfer capability um, work through, uh, you know, an improved existing order 1000 process or would you um, have a different process layered on top of it? Any, any thoughts about how, um, what would be an effective way to go about coordinating with your neighbors to increase interregional transfer capability? Well, our, our own experience has largely been that it's it's not so much about process at this point as about uh, having the right cost allocation discussion that people can engage in and still feel they have some control. The uh, benefits-based cost allocation framework that was enshrined in Fort Quarter 1000 has been a real uh, barrier for the conversations we've been engaging in. I can't speak to what level the competitive solicitation process or procurement of transmission has impeded more effective dialogue. Uh, I, I've heard of that, but I, I don't have any personal information to tie that to. But the cost allocation issue has certainly been front and center uh, that we would see needing improvements. Uh, so that that's where we're we're pushing. We and that's why I said we, from our perspective. And given what I'm hearing about issues in the Eastern interconnection, I can understand the enthusiasm around this minimum transfer capability, but uh, I'm struggling to see how that in itself would uh, materially move the ball down the field on the issues we're looking to address to get more transmission built. Okay, well, that's helpful um, and uh, not particularly surprising that cost allocation is a barrier. So maybe our fourth panel can, uh, um, we'll be able to tackle that. Uh, but with that, I know Phil, you also uh, had comments. So please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very quickly. Uh, first, I just have to uh, correct Dr. Reed. I was never a chairman. If I had been, this conversation might be very, very different. But that aside, um, this comes out of the July 20th meeting uh, and also subsequent conversations. But uh, I think Chairman Stanek at the July 20th meeting pointed out, you know, the, there are states in the East that are looking to offshore wind. We all know that. New Jersey's been working very closely with PJM on that. But you've got a situation with Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. And if you follow it down, obviously Maryland down, down the coast, where there, there's a lot of aggressiveness on, on trying to plan for offshore wind. But 
you know, those those three states I mentioned earlier are very close to each other, only a few miles apart, but they're three different RTOs. So we've been talking a lot about the uh, existing transmission grid and the potential of, uh, that I think is, is great, depending on the situation and the back patterns uh, of expanding uh, capacity between regions. But this is a new area that perhaps the commission would wanna focus on in an effort to keep costs down uh, and, and make sure that the planning is done as efficiently as possible, given what states wanna do there and, and the need, and presumably the need for better coordination uh, would then help customers with lower bills. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Phil. Uh, any other panelists' um, thoughts or reactions on uh, this topic of, you know, what is driving the need for interregional transfer capability? If not, I don't see any other hands raised. I did have um, a follow-up question for uh, Dev Milstein um, that I, you know, I think he might be able to provide a little insight as well um, on the question of what are the barriers to identifying or assessing the drivers for um, the need for interregional transfer capability. So, Dev, my my question for you is, um, you know, you mentioned in your presentation that. Much of the value of transmission is concentrated in a small number of hours, um, and it can be uh, particularly challenging to represent uh, uncertainty, extreme weather, other high value conditions um, in forward looking models to estimate transmission value. Um, you know, I know we'll be tackling uh, some of the more specific specifics of um, transmission planning models, et cetera, in our in our future panels, but I was wondering if you could elaborate, as long as we have you, um, elaborate a bit about uh, the challenges that you mentioned um, to, you know, modeling uncertainty, extreme weather, et cetera, uh, and anything that you found from your research uh, to be helpful to overcome those challenges. Any ideas or recommendations for transmission planners to, um, to consider to better capture those high value hours? Um, so any, any thoughts, Deb? Yeah. And we're still a little bit at the beginning of our research on that particular issue, but what we have started to see is that the value of transmission uh, substantially increases in a lot of cases between the day ahead and real time market. So what that indicates is that there are unexpected um, conditions popping up between those two markets. So basically within 24 hours of a real time market that were not expected. And that that's one thing that can drive uh, the value of transmission higher. And so things that might cause that would be an outage of a generator or multiple generators at the same time, or an outage of an existing transmission line, uh, a, a missed forecast of load or of, uh, of weather or of, um, resource generation as well. And so that relates back to modeling. A lot of models or, or a certain number of models have deterministic simulations. In other words, they're not really capturing those unexpected events. Or if they do try to capture the unexpected events, they don't necessarily have uh, correlated outages worked into the model simulation. And so if you're not capturing those types of events, then, then you really might miss the, some of the value there. Okay, great. That's helpful context, uh, and I'm sure we'll, um, you know, set up the conversation well for our following panels that that dig into those details. Um, so I don't see any other uh, panelists' hands raised. So with that, I will turn it back over to Andrew um, to move on to our next question. Michael, um, for our panel, the next question is a minimum amount of interregional transfer capability between transmission planning regions necessary to ensure just and reasonable commission jurisdictional rates? If so, what evidence is there to support or negate that position? And how will planning for a minimum amount of interregional transfer capability produce, produce just and reasonable rates? Um, and I'm actually gonna start this one with you, Phil, um, as someone who you know is a, a, an expert on <laughs> commission just and reasonable rates. Well, I, I think, thank you for the question. Uh, <clears throat> again, this can be done now. And so th in that sense, 
you know, there's it's a long history of it. Uh, I, I look to Neil and I think of myself as a Pacific Northwesterner and we had the traditional uh, California would send power up in the winter when the, uh, the heavy electric heat Northwest would need it and the Northwest would, in BC, would send power down in the summer when it was hot. And so, uh, you know, this is, this is nothing new and it can be encouraged. I just think that it's really hard to assign a minimum amount for each uh, th that would be universal. I think each region is going to be very different. And I was talking to Elliot Meinzer last week at Kaiso. You know, it's just the fact patterns are going to be very, very different in each each situation related to the infrastructure involved. And of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, defining the benefits in a way the, the benefits defined by California are going to be different than the benefits defined by Wyoming. Uh, that's a fact. We can deal with that. Uh, but that does flow into the cost allocation decisions that are tough. And I think as we look, particularly in the short term, and, and that's, that's what I'm talking about because I think there is some urgency here, working on, as Chair Thomas at the time suggested, uh, these seams issues, particularly what MISO and SPP are working on, uh, are, are some low-hanging fruit that can perhaps uh, show other regions how to do this in an effective way. Again, thank you for the question. Thank you for the response. Um, and panelists, just continue to raise your hands. Um, and we will turn to Christina. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be part of the uh, Pacific Northwest uh, contingent here today at the uh, tech conference. And I think what uh, Phil Muller was speaking to really is the need for regional flexibility in how this is determined, not just in terms of what amount of interregional capacity is provided, but also how and where. If it's by a number of interregional lines that provides for uh, redundancy and resilience um, in terms of the the megawatt capacity. Also, the uh, other piece we keep hearing is the, the phrase of the day is unconstrained. There have been a couple of studies recently that talked about the benefits of unconstrained transmission capacity. So there was a Princeton study a few months ago talking about integration of uh, facilities under IIJA and IRA funding and how much transmission is needed to bring those new resources onto the system. And in fact, if transmission uh, building is done at its current pace, greenhouse gas emissions will actually go up um, if new facilities are electrified, but without new uh, resources coming onto the system. So the pace of transmission construction needs to almost double in order to reliably integrate and cost-effectively integrate uh, new resources as provided under recent, uh, recent legislation. So unconstrained is very helpful for that. And also I think you're going to hear about the GE, GE NRDC study uh, later in the workshop uh, that talks about how the reduced, uh, there's reduced uh, concern about potential reliability uh, events with an unconstrained uh, transmission system. So it's really uh, helpful to think about this with uh, regional flexibility and also consideration of facilities that have already been built. Uh, any new requirements should not be simply additive, you know, they shouldn't uh, require all new facilities uh, to be built, but to simply uh, build upon uh, facilities that are already in existence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll turn next to Chair Pridemore. So when I thought about this question, what, what brought it home for me was the concept of insurance. So the, the OATT allows utilities to go and build transmission based upon need and then see cost recovery from their requisite states. And so when you, when you think about insurance, I can go buy any number of types of insurance for my home or for my business, but it's flexible and it's up to me to be able to decide what I want to purchase. Um, a minimum ITC is going to have an established cost to it. And that cost then is going to have to be spread across the utilities who are going to come to commissions like mine and seek rate recovery. And so I, I would I would caution the commission to think first about um, is, the, is, is the minimum ITC even necessary in an area? Now, mind you, of course, I'm speaking as a non-RTO region, um, but is it even necessary? And therefore, how does that 
uh, Jill, with the concept of just and reasonable. So on a rate case, I'm looking at just and reasonable in the same way that the FERC's looking at JNR. And so if something is necessary, is it just or reasonable? Thank you for that, Chair Pridemore. Yeah, um, insurance is definitely a paradigm I've thought about a lot in this context. So um, you are not alone. Um, we'll turn next to Simon. Yeah, I, I wish there was a, a clear and easy answer that I could give you all for this, but I, you know, going back to um, standardization of and quantification of both the costs and the benefits of, of reliability and the economic components of the transmission system, um, the harmonization uh, that has to occur on a region by region basis um, is vitally important in order to get the cost allocation component of this right. Um, if you don't get similar benefit metrics between regions shared between those regions, I, I'm not quite sure how you get the cost allocation uh, question answered. And in order to do that, you have to have common models and to have common models, you have to have those common costs and those common benefit metrics. Um, I've not seen any of that between MISO and CERTEP or CERTEP and uh, the Florida Reliability Council. And, and to that end, it would be helpful to have something like an independent transmission monitor to conduct that type of an analysis, um, to have minimum transmission planning standards, um, and minimum benefit standards to begin to answer some of those questions. And, you know, going back to the beginning of this workshop, Dr. Milstein's study really focused on the economic benefits of transmission uh, on it in a regional basis, focusing on locational marginal pricing. And so we don't have locational marginal pricing data here in the Southeast because the data aren't collected. Um, we do have economic congestion in the Southeast. Uh, we do have generator outages in the Southeast. It's just that the data aren't transparent. And so I'll, I'll leave a rhetorical question to answer the question. Um, how can refusal to measure locational marginal pricing be just and reasonable? Well, thank you for the rhetorical question. Because it's rhetorical, I won't be answering it. Um, but I do have a follow-up on something you spoke of earlier, which was that um, you said in a lot of MISO stakeholder meetings, today's economic projects are tomorrow's reliability projects. And Neil mentioned this earlier about the two lines he mentioned that, you know, they were approved and cost allocated for a specific reason. And over time, the benefits associated with those projects have changed. And I think that that's kind of a similar paradigm to your phrasing earlier. So um, I was just wondering if you wanted to elaborate on that and, you know, what we could try and be doing to encompass all of the benefits, noting that those benefits are probably going to change over time. Yeah, this has been a really difficult nut to crack, even in the MISO stakeholder processes. Um, with the long range transmission planning process that we've had in MISO, um, frankly, there was a huge fight over benefit metrics and how to cost allocate. And that's why there was a split between MISO North and MISO South, um, where MISO North found a need to move forward on the benefit metrics and the transmission projects that they saw necessary to uh, be built in a timely fashion while um, we we are uh, awaiting the MISO South projects. So there's, there's several steps going on. Uh, tranche one was approved by the MISO board uh, earlier this year. We're, we're looking forward to tranche two, uh, ideally uh, getting approved by the MISO board next year, moving on to tranche three, uh, where MISO South projects will be dealt with. And then um, we are working on uh, advanced cost allocation discussions into next year so that we can work on uh, tranche four, which will address the north-south interconnection uh, problem that we've had, um, where there is literally one physical connection uh, between the north and the south. There, there are contractual uh, connections between the north and the south where you can uh, flow uh, on a, uh, on a uh, limited basis more power between the north and the south, but when 
there are physical constraints uh, with our neighbors. As we saw with Winter Storm Uri, those constraints get called and then um, you have real power problems down in MISO South. Um, and so there, there had been a lot of cost allocation discussions uh, regarding what to do with the benefit metrics, how to, how to measure those benefit metrics, um, uh, even between uh, SPP and MISO trying to solve the seams issues. I know there's, there's uh, been some discussion about trying to focus just on the seams. Um, historically, MISO and SPP have, have tried to do a coordinated system plan or, or a, uh, a joint study uh, plan, and, and those efforts have historically not led to actual transmission getting planned because you have separate models that are being run in different uh, time horizons that are being discussed. SPP looks at a 40-year horizon, but MISO only looks at a 20-year horizon. Um, and so going back to um, my primary concern is if you don't have standardized benefit metrics and you don't have standardized costs, um, and even standardized models to certain extents, um, you're not going to find uh, enough solutions, even on the, the, the minor seams issues that I think we can all recognize as problems uh, with today's system, let alone trying to plan the system of 10 years into the future or 20 years into the future. Um, and then you, you layer on top of that, the problem of the Southeast only, only looking at one benefit metric. Um, and so we have many different uh, problems that are compounding on top of each other that are leading to uh, limited large scale transmission actually getting built. Thank you for that. And Neil, I, since I called you out by name, I just wanted to ask if you had anything you wanted to add or you're good. Okay. Um, well, not seeing any other raised hands, I believe I will turn it back over to my co-moderator, Michael. Okay, thank you. So for our uh, next question, I believe I will um, direct this initially to our uh, non-RTO state representative, uh, Chair Pridemore. Um, I, you know, we want to know, does the potential need for a minimum amount of interregional transfer capability differ between RTO and non-RTO regions? Uh, and why or why not, uh, and is a minimum amount of interregional transfer capability necessary for non-RTO regions? Why or why not? I know you had you know touched on this in your opening uh, remarks, but I'm curious if you'd like to uh, elaborate any further on this point. Thanks, Michael. So I, I'm not going to speak to my friends that are in RTO regions. Um, I, I know that they have needs, and based upon their RTO, uh, those needs do vary. And so I, I, I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves, but representing a non-RTO state, um, I, I can tell you that um, a minimum ITC isn't necessary much in the same way that an ITM isn't necessary. I mean, I think we're at the point in a state like Georgia, we do not have an RPS. We're number four in the nation in solar. We're retiring legacy coal. Uh, we're building out the inter and interstate plans to increase transmission to continue to increase the amount of renewables in our system. And we have 4.5 uh, gigawatts of renewable energy in Georgia, not counting the additional 250 megawatts that we're seeing out of our 41 electric co-ops. So we continue to grow and build and manage the demands of this transition that uh, our, our nation and this world is in right now, getting to cleaner power. Um, I, I think at some point, you know, we're just sort of, squabbling about the the, the details. Um, and, and at that point, I'd rather us keep our eye on the ball and our eye on the ball is producing safe, affordable, reliable, clean power. And, and I think in Georgia that we're doing a good job of it. And, and I think that with the help and guidance of the folks at CERC, that even makes it more possible. Okay, thank you, Chair Pridemore. I know that, um... Several other folks also uh, touched on this in their opening statements. So just wanted to open it up to the other panelists. Uh, again, this question of uh, difference between RTO and non-RTO regions. Should the commission be thinking of non-RTO regions uh, differently um, and, and why or why not? Any additional thoughts there from, from folks? Uh, Simon, I see your, your hand raised. So I think we'll go to you next and then uh, Christina and Phil. So go ahead, Simon. Yeah, I, 
Um, as you can imagine, I think the RTO and non-RTO regions should not be treated uh, uh, separately um, because we are all one system. Um, as we saw with Winter Storm Uri, the, the limits that occurred within CERC did have an impact on MISO South, which then had a follow-on impact into SPP. Um, that's what the final report said from MISO. Uh, that's what the final report said from NERC and from FERC. And we would not have known that, uh, that CERC was having generation and transmission constraints um, had MISO not pulled together the reports on the heroic efforts that they were trying to pull together um, to uh, raise the limits to ensure that folks in MISO South had the power that they need to keep the lights on. Um, the lack of transparency in, in CERTEP is a real problem um, that makes it seem as though things are fine when uh, they aren't. And until we can fix that problem, uh, we will continue believing that things are fine until uh, one day we will wake up and, and something bad may happen. Um, we do know that, again, certain states like Florida and Alabama do not have integrated resource planning state docketed proceedings. Um, and so uh, I, I do really enjoy the Georgia Public Service Commission integrated resource planning process, um, but not all states have uh, as robust of an IRP process as a state like Georgia. Um, and then we do have other states like Kentucky and Mississippi that uh, are effectively on multiple seams. Mississippi resides partly in MISO, partly in uh, Southern Company territory, and then also within TVA. And then you have Kentucky, which is uh, one of the most diverse states, uh, I'll say, in the country, where they have um, part of their territory in TVA, um, part in uh, Louisville Gas and Electric, which is an unaffiliated area, part in PJM, and part in MISO. And so um, for Commissioner Kent Chandler's sanity, uh, I, I would recommend um, a, a standardized uh, for for the country um, so that we can have some minimum benefits. Um, and so I do think that there, there are some, some values and some economies of scale to be had. And um, with regards to an independent transmission monitor, I don't foresee an independent transmission monitor um, taking over the role of the state regulator. If, if I had my druthers, um, our state commissions would have would already have independent transmission consultants on board that are conducting these transmission planning processes um, alongside with with their partner utilities. Um, but in in some of these states, they do not have the funds in order to do that. And so I, I would view an independent transmission monitor um, to be a, an addition, uh, to be a, a consultant and an ability to conduct these robust and, and difficult uh, data analyses that many of our state agencies don't have the funding or expertise to perform um, because it is a very complicated process and it, it's always good to have a second independent uh, opinion on very complicated, um, expensive, and important uh, work that, that lies ahead. Okay, thank you. That that's helpful, uh, Simon. And I uh, uh, got a request from folks on my side to help clarify the the use of acronyms. Um, I believe folks were uh, using ITM to mean inter, uh, uh, independent transmission monitor, uh, in contrast to um, interregional transfer capability ITC. So just in case uh, uh, folks were getting lost in acronyms, I know we have an alphabet soup around here sometimes. I uh, just want to clarify that. Um, so I, I know, um, Christina, you had your uh, hand raised before. Um, would you like to uh, weigh in on the uh, RTO versus non-RTO um, discussion? Yes, please. Okay, please go for it. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to address the workshop today on these important issues, and they do pertain in non-RTO regions as well as RTO regions. There are additional considerations, though, uh, to be evaluated. Uh, 
most importantly, the need to ensure regional planning uh, as well as interregional, because it does no good to have the interregional transmission to deliver the power, but then not be able to distribute it throughout the region. So they very much need to be uh, part and parcel. I want to uh, congratulate Georgia uh, for doing it so well. And I think actually it um, provides a uh, great reason for uh, ensuring regional flexibility. Uh, certainly it would be helpful for the commission to set fundamentally a floor, but then look at what each uh, state and region is doing to meet that already. Some some regions are in great shape. As noted, MISO weathered Winter Storm Uri about as well as it could have, and in fact was able to wheel through power to SPP, uh, which is sort of the model that we hope everyone is able to follow. Uh, but as seen, it's not always the case. Um, so it would be helpful to have the uh, regional, the transmission planning regions to be able to assess what they have and evaluate what they need for interregional transmission. I don't think there's a consensus around what kind of formula would be best, uh, but certainly anything that can move us towards the sort of unconstrained transmission system would be helpful for reliability to ease resource adequacy shortfalls and relieve the uh, related cost pressures. So thank you for the opportunity to address the workshop today. Great, thank you, Christina. And um, then I see uh, Phil, uh, you have your hand raised and after Phil, we'll go to Liza. So please go ahead, Phil. Well, thank you very much, um, Jill. I, I think uh, I alluded to this earlier, but if you step back, I feel like what we're hearing from the West is that they have a lot of work to do, but it is now uh, almost universally acknowledged that this is an issue, a set of issues that has to be worked on aggressively uh, given, again, the resource adequacy issues and the need for transmission. So I would say, although I'm not speaking for the West, that they feel like they're making a lot of progress. I would say, uh, particularly in the Southeast, and I, heard, I think you heard this from North Carolina Chair Duffley too, they generally feel like they have things under control and that they can develop this if they want to with their other states. I think the real tricky part is going to be uh, when you have non-RTO, to RTO issues because you've got uh, you've got different issues. You got you've got contract paths as opposed to full gate paths. So that's where it would become really tricky. But um, thank you for the chance to answer the question. Great, thank you, Phil. And um, then I'll, I'll turn to Liza next. Please go ahead, Liza. Thank you so much. I wanted to you know think about this question from. What's the right level of complication here? And what's the right level of ordering or the right ordering, I should say. Um, there are a lot of complicated issues as we have discussed in this past hour and a half. But when we think about the RTO versus non-RTO, I firmly believe that non-RTO should also be held to a minimum tra transfer capacity standard. It's because I think the driver of this question assumes that the market uh, the organized market is a primary reason for this, when in fact, while of course at Niskan and market solutions are incredibly important to us, the interregional planning requirement is more strongly driven by the, con the concept of federalism, right? And the right role of where FERC should act and what FERC's responsibilities are. This minimum transfer capacity concept or interregional transfer capacity to keep with the same acronyms we've all been using, uh, it's an appropriate and narrow federal role to support the federal desire and requirement to oversee and ensure a reliable supply of electricity. We've heard on this panel a variety of positions about how this shouldn't be a required process because there are so many processes underway, but all of these processes have resulted in an inequitable transfer capacity, which we can see from anyone's estimate not just ours of what existing transfer capacity is and what it what it could be and what that would mean for a more reliable um, functionality of our grid. Also, these existing processes are not universal, but are pursued in these siloed, sometimes pairs, sometimes even just silo within the existing region. These processes we've heard are self-centered as they should be. Right, a regional plan should be addressing the folks in the region, which means it can't consider and isn't considering the value of these interregional connections. We also know from these discussions, and you know, we've been referencing the July for Canary Task Force, but 
of course, folks who have been following the task force know that this conversation started, I think, back in February, if not sooner, right, that there have been a series of these conversations at these task force meetings. And one of the points brought up back in February was the idea that these, these links value will change over time. And we need to think about that and what that means about how difficult it is to, again, consider in existing regional planning processes and existing cost allocation methodologies. And we saw from Mr. Milstein's presentation that it's also outside of traditional modeling capabilities. So I just wanted to sort of summarize that the reason that I think it's so important for this RTO and non-RTO um, to, to be part of the interregional transfer requirement is that it's outside of these processes and therefore like just an essential place for FERC to step in um, and address reliability and resilience issues that cannot be well captured in any of these siloed processes. Okay, great. Thank you, Liza. And, and uh, thanks to all the panelists for uh, weighing in on, on that question. It's much appreciated. Um, any any uh, additional thoughts on this RTO versus non-RTO question before we move on? Chair Pridemore, uh, please go ahead. I see your hand raised. The one thing that I hope that we we do attach to this overall conversation about a minimum, a minimum ITC is that there is going to be a cost component to it. Uh, anytime that uh, we we see uh, the federal government uh, put a standard in place, it is going to increase costs. And during this time, we, we are seeing things, everything costing more and inflation uh, being such a part of consumers' lives and a rate payer's life. Um, I just want for us to be considerate of the fact that transmission is 90% rate recovered. And so uh, a minimum ITC is going to have costs associated with it. And so it is now necessarily the right time to be able to incorporate additional costs. Okay, thank you for that, Chair Pridemore. Um, any, uh, again, I'll open it up. Any additional thoughts uh, before we move on? All right, thanks folks. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, to Andrew. Thank you, Michael. Um, at this time, we're going to turn to our commissioners for any questions they may have. Um, commissioners, uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask any additional questions. I know Commissioner Clements has one, so we'll begin with her. Thanks, Andrew. I have two questions both of which were touched on in various ways, but I'd like to add, pull, try and pull out some more input on them. Uh, and the first one, I'll start with Ms. Reed and, and uh, Ms. Hayes, because you both spoke to these, uh, this specifically. You know, there's a record that demonstrates lots of um, potential benefits and related cost savings, net cost savings for customers for an increase in interregional transfer capability. Some amount, right? Commissioner Christie kind of corrected me at the beginning. There, there is existing, we're talking about incremental amounts. And then I'm also hearing a call for flexibility and as well as a perspective that some of the existing systems that regions are using should get at these issues. So Ms. Reed and Ms. Hayes and then others who want to weigh in, could you say a little bit more about whether we should be considering this floor, some sort of floor that if existing processes satisfy, then there isn't an, an incremental responsibility so long as that floor is met. That way we're not interfering with existing processes that are working, but to the extent we're missing some of these on the record um, benefits and, and, and related uh, cost savings that come from the development of interregional, increased interregional transfer capability that we allow uh, for that to take place as well. So I, I think I understand the question to be um, how, how we consider sort of existing regional capacity, adding additional regional capacity, and the potential to move beyond a floor. Um, so I'll, I'll speak to those quite briefly, and then I'm eager to hear my fellow panelists, uh, Christina's responses as well. The first is that I think adding interregional capacity and the concerns about what it would mean about existing processes, while I won't pretended ignorance that it will not complicate existing processes and existing transmission planning efforts that are ongoing. It, it does provide 
it, a certainty, right? And that that excess capacity, we've already seen sort of all that economic value um, and can extrapolate what the resilience value would be. And so requiring, for example, California to increase to a 15% over what my estimates are, are a 12%, um, adds more capability to California that can then be seen in California and um, California can then adjust how they use their transmission system and continue their transmission planning. This is the engineer in me again, that you create the rules on the system and then the system works around it. And that is what we have been doing with the electricity system for over a hundred years now is adding incremental rules and changing incremental rules and then adjusting around. And I think there's certainly sufficient evidence that this incremental rule is necessary. As far as creating a floor versus growing, um, I'm sure Christina has more to add here. So I'll just say briefly that um, I'll, I'll take half a loaf. I will take the half a loaf of a floor. And I think increasing that capacity also then creates this nationwide data set, ideally to Simon's many points throughout this panel that demonstrates this value, that we create it almost the reverse. We create it for resilience and reliability reasons now, and then it will immediately demonstrate its economic benefit um, is what all the, all the studies are showing us and expecting. Um, and so um, I think that alone could be a motivation for further interregional, but I certainly will take the half a loaf of a floor and pass it to my colleague, Christina, to discuss whether that's a floor or a ramp. Thank, thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, I wanted to um, follow up with that. It has been difficult to establish a consensus um, threshold. So if it's 15% of peak load, if it's some other number, um, or is it a methodology? And maybe maybe it is a methodology. Uh, there are uh, folks out there who have talked about common mode failure as a way of evaluating what happens when all the gas in a region goes out and you can't use any of the gas plants. What happens when the sun goes down and none of the solar is effective? Um, so there are other ways to gauge um, sort of what that amount of interregional capacity would need to be, what the amount would need to be that is uh, imported. So maybe a methodology might be more appropriate, and certainly um, the commission needs to start with some sort of uh, some sort of floor to make sure that we have something to build on. Um, but then regional flexibility in terms of how to implement that would would certainly make a lot of sense. Uh, activating the transmission planning regions, certainly the RTOs are accustomed to responding to FERC, right? Writing reports and things like that. But again, this is a thing that needs to be done um, also outside organized markets uh, in, the, in the bilateral market areas um, and allow allow those regions to also highlight what they have done and what they have done well and allow them to uh, get credit for the facilities that are already in place. Um, you know, as noted before, you know, the things that kept the lights on during winter storm URI between MISO and PJM and SPP and MISO um, should be celebrated for, you know, the resilience benefits that they provided, even if they were initially built to, um, you know, transport wind from from west to east. Um, but you know, once once the what's existing has been assessed, certainly more steps need to be taken. Thank you, uh, Liza and Christina. Um, Michelle, I see that you have your hand raised. Would you like to respond to Commissioner Clements as well? Um, yeah, this is Michelle. I just wanted to respond to, um, I believe it was Christina or Liza, um, and that the California transfer capability is insufficient and is only 8%. And I think what they're, they're um, measuring there is either to the north or the south. So as I indicated, we have 15,000 megawatts of uh, usable transfer capability, and we have 44,000 megawatts of um, you know operational transfer capability. So I think even to begin with, we have to start to define what minimum means, not that we agree that we should go in this direction, but do we mean minimum north, south? Do we mean minimum internal to LADWP and bank? I think it's incredibly complicated, and I think it may distract us from the larger picture of what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, I, uh, Speaking for California, we think we are on the right path, and we think that this could, um, you know, this could, you know, substantially comp complicate our efforts here. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Commissioner Clements, I believe you had another question. 
Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, it's a question for Dr. Milstein and, and if others have um, thoughts, but we've heard a little bit about the need for consistency in modeling uh, and ap I'll call it apples to apples comparison of costs and benefits. And I'm curious if you have a perspective about the opportunity or the benefits that might relate to regions uh, using similar modeling approaches or similar benefit metrics in trying to figure out um, whether or not transfer capability is sufficient uh, at any uh, region's edge. Um, I, I don't think I can speak too much to that question at the moment. Uh, we've mainly been looking at historical price series rather than modeling data. We're just beginning to look at the modeling data. So uh, I think I'll, I'll hold off on, on getting too deep into answering that question. I would say that that's an area of active research and I'm not sure if exactly the same model matters, but maybe a set of approaches that incorporate these types of uncertainties that we're seeing um, would be important. Thanks. That's a question I'm, I'm interested in hearing if uh, future panelists have, have a perspective on it. I mean, I think this conversation leaves me thinking, you know, as we have talked about before, this isn't a question of spending money or not spending money. We are, the, the amount of money going into transmission investment around the country on an annual basis is significant and going to increase. And so the question is, how do we think about any region's priorities on spending uh, relative to to the benefits that, that, that attach to them and appreciating that there's these um, processes in place and, and priorities that are different across regions, how do we then make sure that this, this key component, this, this ability to pass power from one to the next, to the next, to the next, beyond the, the uh, weather pattern that, that we're facing or other situations of system stress, uh, how do we how do we do that? So I appreciate all of your input today. Thanks, and that's all for me, Andrew. Thank you, Commissioner Clements. Um, do we have any questions from any of the other commissioners on the line? Yes, I, uh, I didn't click on that little yellow hand. Uh, not that not that good at Zoom as we always do Teams. Uh, just one question for the panel. Really, is is to is to inject a. Uh, a legal question into this because at FERC, you know, we have to be concerned about what our authority is. Uh, several of the speakers, of course, want us to mandate a interregional a minimum between RTO and non-RTO states. And I think several of the upcoming speakers are going to advocate that too. My question is, one thing we know uh, if this state is perfectly available, it's not hidden, is that rates to consumers are generally lower in the non-RTO states than in the RTO states. That applies to both the non-RTO states in the southeast and the north and the, the west. And so for FERC to mandate that type of minimum transfer capacity, it seems to me like it's not gonna it's not gonna be able to be based on on a 205 or 206, would be a 206 um, allegation of unjust and unreasonable rates in the non-RTO states, because those rates are already generally lower. Uh, it would have to be based on our authority. Uh, to uh, uh, under reliability standards. So it, it seems to me that the record would have to be about reliability. If you're gonna if prefer to mandate something on the non-RTO states, it would have to be a reliability basis as opposed to a 206. I know that's uh, maybe a little bit legally esoteric, but at the end of the day, we have to have legal authority and, and a record to do it. So I would just uh, make that point. If anybody wants to comment, that's fine. Uh, that could be the kind of thing that gets briefed in a you know, brief later, but I think that's important to, to note. Thanks. And and uh, great job to all the speakers, really enjoyed it. Thank you for that, Commissioner Christie. Um, Simon, I see you have your hand up. Would you like to respond to the commissioner? Yeah, just, just a couple thoughts here. Um, one, historically, um, at least over the past few years, um, the, the lowest electric rates that I've seen have come out of Oklahoma and Louisiana. And predominantly, that's been because of lower natural gas prices, but also uh, very low wind power costs. Um, throughout the Southeast, we have seen uh, electric rates in increasing. Um, relative to the rest of the United States, rates are, are moderate, I'll say. 
But I think the question here is the transmission rate. Typically, transmission rates are bundled with generation. And I think we've seen with the low cost of natural gas over the past decade really hide the transmission component of the bundled rates throughout the southeast. And as natural gas prices are increasing, we're going to be seeing rate impacts throughout the southeast, including in places like Louisiana that have had pretty significant dependence on natural gas for a very long time. We're going to see the overall rate increase. And so I think the question should really focus on is the transmission component of the rates just and reasonable. And going back to my rhetorical question that I asked previously, throughout much of the southeast and the SIRTEP region, we are not evaluating, we are not measuring locational marginal pricing. And it seems to me that refusal of measuring that basic economic principle and not trying to evaluate it or do a cost-benefit analysis on it, I just wonder how can refusal of measuring the locational marginal price, how can that in and of itself be just and reasonable? Thank you for that response, Simon. Christina, would you like to respond to Commissioner Christie as well? Yes, please. Thank you. I just wanted to note briefly that it's important to plan for what lies ahead because it takes 10, 15 years to plan, site, permit, and construct a transmission line. We have to be looking ahead. And as we do so, we know that the resource mix is changing. This is not just a public policy in some places and not others. This is throughout the country. I really like learning today that Georgia is fourth in the country for solar in a state that does not have a renewable portfolio standard. It shows that truly renewable resources are nationwide and that requires the transmission to be built to integrate them reliably and cost effectively. So for those reasons, I think it's imperative that the Commission Act. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, and thank you to all of our panelists for their responses to the Commissioner's questions. I'd like to wrap up our panel today by thanking everyone again for attending. We appreciate your participation. We will now be taking a 20-minute break, and we will begin the second panel with a presentation from the U.S. Department of Energy at 2.45 p.m. Eastern. Um, panel one panelists, please sign off the Zoom link, and if you would like to continue watching the workshop, please use the public well, uh, the public webcast link on the work page event page at FERC.gov. Panelists for panel two should log on shortly and run through technical logistics to make sure everyone has been able to connect. Thank you so much, and thank you for participating, and have a great day.
Good afternoon and welcome back to the workshop. My name is Samin Perovi and I'm an attorney advisor with the Office of Energy Policy and Innovation at FERC. I will be co-moderating the second panel today along with Matt Butner, who is an economist also with the Office of Energy Policy and Innovation. Before we kick it off to the full panel, we have a presentation from the Grid Deployment Office of the US, US Department of Energy. After that presentation, we will begin our second panel discussion, which will be on considerations for establishing potential interregional transfer capability requirements. So with that, let's get started with the second presentation of the day. With us is Dr. Adria Brooks from the DOE's Grid Deployment Office in the Transmission Division, and she will be presenting on understanding minimum transfer capability requirements. Adria, you are welcome to go ahead. Great, thanks Samin, thanks Matt. Thanks to everyone at the Commission for having me here today. Um, really what I'll just be doing today is setting up just general understanding of what we're talking about here today. And we've already heard a lot in the previous panel, um, but just wanna really like set the tone, understand where we're at currently with status quo. Um, and then we'll move in of course, to some other questions that the experts we have lined up for the panel they're, they're gonna get into. If you could bring up the slides, please. And go on to the next one. Great. So I want to talk first just about, again, some definitions. So we've talked about transfer capability a lot already, but also there's this idea of transfer capability as a percentage of peak demand. Um, and perhaps we don't need another acronym in the industry, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce one. So this TCPD, just to help move this along, so I'm not saying transfer capability as a percentage of peak demand for the next 15 minutes. In general, this is an understanding of how do we measure transfer capability and then in percentage of what? So when we were to just take an example here between the SERPT region and PJM, and apologies to my South Carolina colleagues, I've grouped you in with SERP just for this example, um, but we can look at the transfer between these two neighbors. So summing up all the transfer capability that exists between them. And then if we were to divide that by the peak demand, but notably the highest peak demand of the two neighbors, so in this case, that'd be PJM. So this would be that TCPD ratio for a bilateral transfer. You can go to the next slide. Another way to think about this though, is if we were to talk about the aggregate for an entire region, not just for an individual transfer. So again, in this example, if we were to look at the aggregate regional TCPD ratio for all of SERPT, now we're looking at summing up the transfers for that region with all of their neighbors. And then when we're talking about peak demand, instead of looking at the peak demand, the highest peak demand of their neighbor. Now we're just talking about their own peak demand. So this second uh, value, this aggregate regional transfer TCBD is really a lot more intuitive in terms of what would be your total import or export capacity, at least from what the transmission that's available. You can go to the next slide. All right, so several important considerations in how we calculate this value. Peak demand, that's easily defined. Um, everyone in the industry, when they say peak demand, they know what they're referring to, what their colleagues are referring to. But transfer capability is a little less easily defined. There's several different definitions out there that people use. So it's important to try to understand what we're saying when we use this. And that would be an important thing for FERC to consider if they were to establish some type of minimum. You can go to the next slide. So here's several important considerations uh, that come up when we're trying to evaluate these ratios. So what are the geographic boundaries to consider for region? Obviously there's the transmission planning regions, order 1000 regions, but even within those, if utility were to switch which planning region they want to be within, they could bring with them a lot of transfer capability. So these are by no means stagnant uh, geographic boundaries. Also, what year of demand data to use? Are we looking at historic or projected future demand data? What transfer capability calculations do we want to use? So. We're just talking about summing up the thermal limits of all transmission lines, or we considered more about some contingency power flow analysis. Also directionality, is that important for transfer capability, right? So we know that we can push power in one direction across the line, and that's gonna be a different value than what you could push in the opposite direction. But we need to consider that uh, when we're looking at establishing these values. You can go to the next slide. So here is the status quo for what we have today. Um, as Dr. Liza Reed pointed out in the previous panel, though, of course, these are estimates, right? There's lots of other values out there, um, just relying on what's publicly available. These are the numbers that we at DOE came up with. So for the most part, there are some regions that have more than, just a handful of regions that have more than 10%. 
but the majority of all these bilateral transfers between neighbors are less than 10% of the highest region's peak demand. So again, these are the bilateral transfers that are being shown here. This is a combination of model data, so including the EPA model data that was uh, used and talked about previously, um, but then also looking at NERC reliability publications and what they see as the import-export capability of these regions. You can go to the next slide. And this is just showing that distribution. So again, of the 15 bilateral transfers that exist in the US, at least from the way that we've cut up these geographic regions for purposes of this analysis, 10 of those are less than 10%. And there's a handful that have between 10 and 20% of peak demand. And then there's a couple more that have more than 20%, less than 30% transfer capability as a percentage of peak demand. Now, again, these are the bilateral transfers. So just on this next slide here, this is a distribution for aggregate regional transfers. Now we can see this is a lot more evenly distributed everywhere from zero to 10% or less than 10% up to even 60%. This helps us uh, understand that what might be considered an appropriate import or export capability for some regions, right? Some regions have the ability to share more than 50% of their own peak demand with their neighbors, um, at least in transfer capability of the transmission lines, right? So this just helps paint a picture about how diverse the picture is across the US already. You can go on to the next slide. Okay, so that's the status quo. Now, if we were to talk about what would a new policy, how would that change transfer capability between these regions? Now this transfer, or sorry, this policy was introduced by a handful of different folks. Um, we're not endorsing this particular policy, but just to use it as an example. So let's talk about a 15% bilateral minimum requirement. That would mean all of these transfers that are circled would have to be increased the transfer capability in order to meet this 15% minimum because they're not there yet. You go on to the next slide. All right, so here's what we have. This is the current state of affairs for transfer capability um, for all the regions. Now this is an aggregate. Um, that means there's a little bit of double counting here, right? So if there's say 20 uh, gigawatts of transfer capability between MISO and PJM, that's gonna be double counted in both of those rows, right? So there's a double counting happening here. If we were to institute this 15% bilateral minimum requirement, the next slide will show us what those additions would be. So every region is going to have additions as a result of this minimum requirement. Some regions more than others, of course, right? So if we look at California, it's a pretty small increase that they would see in addition to what they already have. Reason being is they already have pretty high um, bilateral TCBD ratios with their neighbors, right? And then just going up to the search up region again, there they would see more than a doubling of their current transfer capability as a result of this policy. You can go on to the next slide. Okay, so that is an example of just what would happen to transfer capability if we were to institute a minimum policy. But how do we gauge if that policy is useful? How do we benchmark that, right? That's what this whole panel is set up to discuss. You can go into the next one. So Dr. Milstein earlier today already talked about this congestion value from looking at wholesale uh, prices. So I won't talk about that value here, but just to name that of the 2012 to 2021 data that they used, and then in determining those average links between different regions and their neighbors at different points. So taking that map in the upper right, if we were to average that for all the links in a region, here's what those average values would be. And these are ranked. So ERCOT, SVP at the top, and then working our way down to California PJM at the bottom. Of course, we don't have wholesale data for the CERC region, the Southeast. Now this helps serve as a little bit of a comparison of where is there most value for each of these regions, at least using this wholesale congestion data. If you go on to the next slide, we can then compare that to the additions that we would get from this 15% minimum requirement. Now these aren't, I'm, I'm comparing here apples and oranges, right? So we were talking about gigawatts in the blue on the left and then dollars per gigawatt hour on the right. So the values are, aren't important to compare to one another. However, the relative rankings could be considered important in terms of where we're seeing the most value in new transmission is that where we're putting it based on a policy like this. So for ERCOT, for SVP, that perhaps is matching well, coincidentally, uh, but less so the case for New England or California, perhaps, right? Just something to consider. You go on to the next slide. Another way to do this is to try to think about what do capacity expansion models tell us about future interregional transfer capability needs. So the researchers at DOE, we looked at six different recent capacity expansion model studies 
that have come out since 2019. So four from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory or NREL, and then also two academic reports. Uh, so one from researchers from MIT and then one from researchers at Princeton as well. And these models help understand, all right, given some assumptions about the power sector of the future, so generation changes, demand changes, how much transmission would we need to connect that generation and demand? So we took a look at those results to help us understand maybe what new transmission we're gonna need in the future. Go on to the next slide. So there were over 300 different scenarios considered among those six different studies, taking a subset of those scenarios that we think are maybe the closest to what the future is gonna be with the passage of notably the Inflation Reduction Act, but also several other bills that have been passed recently and turned into law, trying to use that as our benchmark as to what is the future power system gonna be and then how much transmission do we need? Or at least how much transmission do these capacity expansion results suggest we need? So again, in gray, this is the same transmission capability that I showed for each region previously. But now in green, this is what the results suggest we're gonna need in the year 2035 to keep up with both generation and demand. So if we go on to the next slide, we'll see if those new additions are gonna get us there. So in blue, again, the same additions I showed previously from that 15% bilateral minimum, we can see that in a handful of regions, right? So in SERPT, Northern Grid, almost for California, West Connect, New York, ERCOT, Florida, they are meeting or surpassing what those capacity expansion results suggest is needed. Now for the other regions, they do fall short of that. You can go on to the next slide. Now I wanna name that, of course, capacity expansion model is just one form of scenario-based modeling, right? This is the first in a large suite of tools that engineers would use to do transmission planning. This really just helps give us a sense of how much transmission is gonna be needed or how much transfer cap capability is gonna be needed. It doesn't necessarily tell us exactly where to put it. So that said though, it does provide us some important information about uh, how to benchmark what we might think is gonna be needed in the future. The next slide. All right, so what if we were to use scenario-based planning in transmission planning? What are some considerations learned from this exercise for coordinated planning? Here's a list of questions that are worth considering. I think a lot of the experts on the panel that we're about to hear from are gonna get into some of this. Uh, so just to walk through them, what is the appropriate planning horizon, right? How far into the future do we need to be looking in order for this to be useful? What load changes should be anticipated over that time horizon? Is planning with our neighbors enough or do we need to plan with our neighbors' neighbors, right? Is, can we just count on getting enough energy from our neighbors if there is an emergency or do we really need to be looking past that? What metrics are best quantify the resilience improvements offered by this new interregional transfer capability? What benefits should be captured? And we heard a lot about that in the last panel. And then finally, what scenario sensitivities would help us understand the trade-offs between all these benefits? Right, there's lots of different assumptions that we could put in to these different scenario planning methods. It's important to understand how uh, one assumption might be useful, whereas another one is not gonna have as much of an impact on the results. This is just gonna um, start the discussion, I hope today, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the panel. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Adria. Uh, I, I think that that kicks us off really well and that sets us up really well for our next uh, for our panel discussion here. Um, we welcome you, Adria, please to stay online and contribute to the panel discussion as, as one of our panelists. And um, I'll now turn it over. Uh, speaking of the panelists, I'll now turn it over to Matt Butner to introduce them. Thank you. Hi, Hi thanks, Bean. Uh, and thank you, Adria, for that presentation. Um, I'll start now the, the panel. This panel will discuss who would be responsible for determining a minimum interregional transfer capability requirement and the relevant considerations for establishing such a requirement, assuming that there is such a need. Specifically, this panel will focus on identifying the objective and drivers of a minimum interregional transfer capability requirement. Before I begin, I'd like to remind all participants to refrain from discussing the specific details of the pending contested proceedings listed on the supplemental notice issue, issued on November 18th and to refrain from any discussions of other pending contested proceedings. If anyone engages in this kind of discussions, my colleagues Moon Athwal or Gonzalo Rodriguez from the Office of the General Counsel will interrupt the discussion to ask the speaker to avoid that topic. Each panelist will introduce themselves and has the option to give initial opening remarks. 
After that, Samina and I will facilitate the question and answer session. We ask for panelists to raise their virtual hand to indicate that they would like to respond to a question. And if that does not work, please unmute yourself and indicate that you would like to respond. Once called on, please unmute yourself and respond. When you have completed your answer, please turn off your microphone and lower your virtual hand. We will reserve time at the end of the panel for the commissioners that are present to ask questions of the panel. However, if a commissioner would like to ask a question during the discussion, we ask that they raise their virtual hand. Samina and I will call on them in turn. Okay, well, with that out of the way, I'd like to call on each panelist to give their brief opening remarks and we'll go in the order and the supplemental notice. First, we have Dr. Deborah Liu. Debbie is the Associate Director of the Energy System Integration Group, also known as ESIG. Debbie, would you like to introduce yourself and give opening remarks? Sure, thank you, Matt, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel. ESIG is a member-based organization. We address technical challenges to grid transformation for decarbonization. Uh, today, I'm speaking for myself, not for our members. Interregional transmission is more essential than ever today because the system is becoming more weather dependent and the climate is changing. Weather patterns are about 1,000 to 3,000 kilometers in scale, so we want transmission to allow for flows greater than that size, this new paradigm. It's important to recognize that we may want to lean on neighbors' neighbors, like what happened in Winter Storm Uri. Interregional transmission has a lot of benefits. The three big ones are, first of all, in the day ahead real-time markets, the transmission allows for cheaper resources to serve load so that overall system costs are cheaper. And second, in the months to years timeframe, the transmission allows for sharing of resources for resource adequacy. So less capacity needs to be built, saving money. And third, in the multiple years timeframe, transmission allows for resilience during extreme events, whether it be a common mode failure like inadequate gas supplies or a large heat dome, a drought, a cyber or physical attack. Now, AGS showed results from a number of studies those studies are mostly getting at that transmission in this first category, saving money by using transmission to share generation resources and to share across load diversity. I don't believe any except um, the NARIS study ran a loss of load expectation to really examine the second benefit, that resource adequacy benefit in detail. And I don't believe any um, did specific resilience analysis to examine this third benefit. Now, if they had, it could potentially increase those interregional transmission needs even more. Um, we recently completed a report, Multi-Value Transmission Planning for a Clean Energy Future. And in that, we analyzed a hypothetical interregional transmission project connecting ERCOT to the Southeast. We found modest production cost and resilience benefits, but the resource adequacy benefits alone were enough to pay for that line. Now, we didn't study the year 2021 in that, but grid strategies did. And they found that the resilience benefit from the Winter Storm URI event by itself would also have been enough to pay for that line. So we've got benefits twice, at least twice the cost of that line. Now, in an ideal world where we would build interregional transmission when total benefits exceeded costs by some amount, um, but we don't seem to be able to build into regional transmission, and we know that URI resulted in some of the largest controlled load shed in history. So if economics is not an ample justification to build, maybe the use of transmission as an insurance policy against unmitigated risks is. A side note is that unlike an insurance policy that only gets used when your house burns down, we're going to be using this transmission hourly and daily to reduce overall cost to customers, and it's going to be paying for itself. Resilience today is something we don't generally plan for in terms of defining, modeling, having criteria and metrics for it. Attempts were made in, in our multi-value transmission report, in MISO's LRTP, and in GE's recent study that you'll hear about in the next panel, where resilience events were modeled and extreme weather led to forced outages and decreased generation. Load shedding was valued at the value of lost load, and that was used to develop um, plans and look at benefits of resilience. This is difficult because we don't have good statistics on frequency of tail events. We know that the frequency of these tail events is going to change in the future with climate change. 
We also know value of all slow is not monolithic. And finally, as we electrify other energy sectors, we're going to become more dependent on electricity. That's also going to affect, affect value of loss load. It's going to be really important that we have standardized assumptions, metrics, methodologies, so that regions can do this analysis together. We don't have that today. All this to say, there's not going to be a perfect methodology. But we know we need to start building interregional transmission now because of the long lead times. And it's going to be critical to getting to affordable, reliable, and clean energy in the future. And so let's not have the perfect be the enemy of what we need to do today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Debbie. Next up, we have Aaron Bloom. Aaron is an executive director at Next Era Energy Transmission. Aaron, would you like to introduce yourself and give opening remarks? Yes, thank you, Matt. So my name is Aaron Bloom, and, and as Matt said, I'm the Executive Director of Interregional Planning at NextEra Energy Transmission. And this is a new role that was created to use transmission to push for the changes that are necessary to transition the electricity system towards our goal at NextEra of Real Zero. Today, I'm representing the entire NextEra Energy Company, which includes Florida Power and Light and NextEra Energy Resources. NextEra is uniquely positioned to comment on planning for extreme events and operating systems with high levels of renewable energy. During Hurricane Ian earlier this year, our Florida Power and Light system was to sustain winds of more than 150 miles an hour and didn't lose a single transmission pole or generator. Of the 12 million solar panels we have on our system, less than 0.3% sustained damage. NextEra is also the largest developer and operator of wind, solar, and storage in the U.S. We have worked in nearly every state and have ambitious plans to propel our company and our customers towards Real Zero. Real Zero is the most aggressive clean energy goal in the country, and NextEra is the first company in history committed to moving past net zero all the way to Real Zero. We'll reach this goal by leveraging low-cost renewables to drive energy affordability for our customers. Our plan is straightforward. Step one, decarbonize ourselves. Step two, share our learnings. And step three, decarbonize America. Transmission is a critical component of reaching all those goals. Prior to joining NextEra, I worked at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. There, I led a team of researchers that conducted some of the country's very first interregional transmission planning studies for systems with high renewables, including the Interconnection Seam Study. We're fortunate to be joined at this workshop by a few of the individuals that have studied the United States power systems at this magnitude and scale. The number of people that have conducted rigorous national scale interregional planning studies is relatively small. This is in part because there's barriers to modeling large power systems. It's hard, it takes big computers. But the real reason there are so few people that have looked at the US bulk electric system at this scale is because the United States is the only macro grid in the world that doesn't have a plan of any type. And that means that the only people that have conducted public planning studies of the combined power systems of North America and what it could look like with hundreds of gigawatts of wind and solar are a bunch of 30 and 40 somethings based at research organizations. Both China and Europe have their own versions of a plan for their macro grids, but the United States does not. That seems like a very risky position to be in for an integral part of the US economy. The United States has neither an aggregated bottoms up plan from each region of the country, nor does it have a centrally planned top down view of the combined systems and their needs. In a country as advanced as the United States, it seems that we should be in the fortunate position of having both forms of planning, both a top down and a bottoms up. Unfortunately, we don't have a long term plan of any type for our interconnected systems. One risk presented by the lack of interregional planning is exposure to common mode failure events. Winter storm Uri is perhaps the best example of this risk. Common mode failures due to extreme weather and disruptions to fuel supply are a clear and present danger to the reliability and resilience of the bulk electric system. This risk is not hedged or accounted for under most conventional planning practices. The risk of common mode events is real and has resulted in the substantial loss of life and property. The risk also appears to be increasing in severity, and this is partially due to changes in the weather, but also because of our increased reliance on the electricity system. Electricity means more to the United States than ever before. 
and certainly more than when the concept of planning reserve margins and loss of load expectations were established in the 1940s and cemented in the 1960s. The commission should adopt a minimum interregional transfer capability as a substitute for more comprehensive planning to mitigate the risk of extreme weather. Another risk presented by the lack of interregional planning is the inability to anticipate and prepare for changes in the resource mix. This risk compounds the risk of common mode failures. Economics and consumer preferences are fundamentally reshaping how Americans want to generate and consume energy. Anticipated changes in resource mix and demand should be considered in establishing a minimum interregional transfer capability. Generation requirements and delayed interconnection queues are critical consideration for establishing a minimum requirement. Planning regions are currently struggling to ensure resource adequacy during a fleet transmission. From a mathematical perspective, we are operating in the gray space of our uncertainty bounds on resource adequacy. There is not a single perfect resource adequacy construct, and we are seeing the effects of mathematical uncertainties in both a physical and administrative manner. Events like Winter Storm Uri highlight the importance of resource accreditation and justify a hedging strategy that manages the risks associated with widespread generation failures, especially during a fleet transition. Existing processes at the seams between planning regions are small and focused on targeted economic problems. And they exclude explicitly large scale projects that could mitigate risk from retirement, delayed interconnection queues and extreme events. The commission should establish a specific long-term competitive process whereby transmission planning regions establish a minimum interregional transfer capability based on observed correlated outage rates. The commission should require transmission planning regions to procure new transmission facilities necessary to fulfill that minimum interregional transfer requirement through a joint competitive process while deferring to the regions on key implementation decisions such as a solicitation or a sponsorship-based model. The commission should refrain from adopting broad voluntary criterion pr principles, but should be careful not to be overly prescriptive in the requirements as well. The commission should root the minimum interregional transfer capability in a measurable and specific risks and identify associated benefits to the bulk power system. Transmission planning regions with multiple neighbors should have flexibility to meet the minimum interregional transfer capability with one or many neighbors based on the combined risk profile of the systems. The next steps for the commission should be to quantify the current amount of transfer capability that is available during extreme events, analyze the correlated outage rates of the various planning regions, and then identify a risk tolerance level for these events in the future. The planning region should be required to develop and implement an interregional planning process for the purpose of calculating, monitoring, and procuring transmission facilities using a broad cost allocation, roughly commensurate with the benefits. That concludes my opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Next up, we have Laura Raup. Laura is Senior Director of Transmission Planning at the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, known as MISO. Laura, would you like to introduce yourself and give opening remarks? Absolutely, and thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Rauch, and as Matt mentioned, I'm the Senior Director of Transmission Planning for MISO. In this role, I oversee MISO's transmission planning function, including reliability, economic, cost allocation, and most relevant for today, interregional planning. I'm pleased to participate in this panel and to share MISO's perspective on both how to most effectively utilize existing interregional transfer capability and to advance opportunities to increase that capability to best serve customers. It's worth emphasizing upfront that MISO believes and has witnessed that interregional transfer capability can provide significant economic and reliability benefits based on the diversity of load patterns, supply resources, and weather across each interconnection. As a multi-state RTO whose footprint includes 15 states and a province in Canada, might know so which misses the value of transmission capability on a daily basis. We view the benefits of interregional transfer capability using the same foundational principles as our regional transmission planning process, that these require policy consensus, a robust business case, and fair cost allocation and recovery. Due to this, we believe that any transmission constructed to enhance interregional transfer capability most have both clarity and consensus on the benefits that it provides, both to ensure appropriate cost allocation 
and to enable the construction through state regulatory processes. We would also note that any process to analyze interregional transfer capability should be considered in tandem with existing regional and interregional planning efforts to avoid conflicts or duplication of efforts. We also recognize that interregional transfer capability is provided most optimally through coordination of both operational and planning horizons. Operations must be equipped to react to the severe, unpredictable, and varied conditions that benefit from increased interregional transfers. Accordingly, from MISO's experience, the most effective approach to utilizing and improving transfer capability across the region would be first, to enhance interregional operations to most effectively utilize existing transmission infrastructure. Secondly, to reinforce effective interregional planning processes. And third, to develop benefit metric or metrics associated with interregional transfer capability that could be incorporated into existing planning processes. That concludes my opening remarks and I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much, Laura. Next up, we have David Kelly. David is Director of Seams and Market Design for Southwest Power Pool, known as SPP. David, would you like to introduce yourself and give opening remarks? Yes, thank you, Matt. And good afternoon and thank you so much to the commission and the commission staff for conducting this technical conference on what is obviously a very important topic, as you'll hear uh, from many of my fellow, fellow panelists today. I feel extremely fortunate to have been selected to participate on such a distinguished group of panelists and to provide my thoughts on the value of interregional transfer capability. Uh, in my role at SPP, um, part of my responsibilities include ensuring SPP has effective interregional transmission planning. Uh, and operational coordination procedures in place between SPP and its neighbors. We've done a tremendous amount of work recently with each of our neighbors to streamline our ability to work together uh, and to evaluate the benefits of building additional transmission that provides mutual benefits, but we know we have more work to do. And to that end, we've begun documenting five-year plans with each of our neighbors on how we can work closer to achieving one of our organization's strategic aspirations, which is to achieve seamless boundaries. On the topic of interregional transfer capability, SPP and its members are supportive of policies and processes that provide for greater reliability and resiliency. Uh, as a regional transmission organization that is responsible for keeping the lights on for nearly 19 million customers across 17 states, having the ability to transfer energy between SPP and its neighbors does provide a critically important tool for our operators to respond to unexpected operating conditions as evidenced by the events of February 2021. Winter Storm URI was undoubtedly an unprecedented event in our organization's history in which we were faced with the incredibly difficult decision to instruct our member utilities to shed load in order to preserve the operational integrity of the grid. While this event was incredibly challenging, it would have been orders of magnitude worse if not for the assistance we received from our neighbors. While we are supportive of FERC leadership on the topic of improving coordination between neighboring regions, there is an extensive amount of expertise within the industry and existing regional and interregional processes that should be leveraged such that the Commission's goals in this proceeding could be accomplished without reinventing the wheel or standing up completely new uh, planning or operational processes. I am uh, sincerely appreciative of the opportunity to participate in today's technical conference, and I look forward to this, the discussion with my fellow pa panelists. Thank you very much, David. Next up, we have Saad Malik. Saad is the Director of Reliability Planning at the Western Electricity Coordinating Council, known as WEC. Saad, would you like to introduce yourself and give opening remarks? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Matt, and thank you. Uh, does not plan the system, or but however, we do uh, analyze the system in in performing reliability assessments and uh, uh, performing studies. Um, and so, at WEG, we believe that there are benefits to re to reliability in diversity. Um, that means diversity in in resource types, uh, the geographic location of these resources 
and then uh, benefits of being able to tap into these these resources from these uh, geographically diverse uh, regions of the system. Uh, um, uh, this panel is seeing with, with the uh, weather events that we've experienced, uh, the variability of, of resources, the variability on the load side. Um, so, so I think those challenges uh, uh, are real and, and they're facing us and, and WEC as the, the reliability entity is, is very focused on, on, on ensuring that, that um, we address those challenges in, in planning in a way that that system remains reliable. Um, the challenge, however, becomes that how best to accomplish those those objectives so that there's there's a right balance that's struck between incentives and and mandates. Um, I'm, uh, I'm excited to be a part of this panel and looking forward to uh, the discussion this afternoon. Thanks, Saad. I just want to note that we had a little bit of a audio glitch there, and some of your words were delayed a bit. Um, hopefully that's not an issue going forward, but okay. if, it, if it continues to be, you know, you can always turn off the video, okay. make sure the audio is clear. All right. Thank you. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you for the opening remarks. Uh, next up, we have Daryl Danis. Daryl is the Senior Director of Transmission at Pattern Energy Group. Daryl, would you like to introduce yourself and give opening remarks? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, Amin. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daryl Danis. I lead the transmission team at Pattern Energy. Uh, Pattern is one of the largest privately held developers, owners, operators of renewable energy in North America. Uh, we, we're also in final development stages of some large, uh, ambitious interregional transmission projects uh, like our Sunzia Southwest transmission project between New Mexico and Arizona, as well as the Southern Spirit transmission project between ERCOT and the Southeast. And my comments and thoughts uh, on today's panel come from the perspective of primarily a developer of both generation projects as well as these, these transmission projects. My overarching position on the topic of interregional transfer capability is that we all know it's a good thing for reliability, which is why many transmission providers withhold some amount of transmission capability to bolster reliability in the form of capacity benefit margin or CBM, at least seasonally. Nevertheless, there's a natural disincentive in many parts of the country for local transmission providers to invest in transmission infrastructure for interregional transfers because the expectation is that local generation can be re relied upon more so than generation coming from another region using interregional transmission lines. I think it's time for us to start thinking about building a power grid that's as big as the weather, as some of our colleagues uh, have said, have said in, in recent history, as we can continue to focus on replacing our fossil-based generation resources with renewable resources. This means we have to get comfortable with the idea that transmission lines are going to become a larger proportion of our energy bills, especially in a zero marginal price energy market. Uh, once we get comfortable with this concept, we can move beyond the question of whether we should have standards associated with interregional transfer capability, and instead of focus on best practices to implement the interregional transmission system of the future. Here in the US, of course, we try to do a good job fostering competition to create price pressure, as well as to bolster growth of new ideas, concepts, and companies. Something that is oftentimes seen as contradictory to these tenets is the idea of central planning. And I agree that central planning isn't generally in our best interests. When we start to think through how to limit constraints to allow the free flow of energy back and forth between regions of the grid, we may need to have a more nuanced view of how we plan the grid. For example, does it make sense to leverage groups like the Eastern Interconnection Planning Collaborative and West Connect to sit atop the various more localized planning activities to establish and or implement standards like a minimum into regional transfer capability requirement to provide a forum to share ideas and allow parties to work together to figure out best practices in effect, does it make sense for us to create a hybrid planning process that does include aspects of central planning as well as the existing more local region specific planning to deal with the fact that we need a grid that does more than what our local planning approaches are designed for. I applaud the Commission for taking steps to figure out what our power grid needs to look like to me a changing mix of load and resources and i'm excited to work with my colleagues to develop and implement these concepts. Thanks. Thank you very much, Daryl. Last, we have Sharon Segner. Sharon is the Senior Vice President of Transmission Policy at LS Power. Sharon, would you like to introduce yourself and give opening remarks? Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity um, to provide a few opening um, comments and principles on the issues relating to interregional planning. 
Um, LS Power is a development, investment, and operating company um, focused on um, the United States and all areas of the United States. In total, we have developed, constructed, and managed and acquired more than 46,000 megawatts of competitive generation and over 660 miles of competitive transmission. And as a company, we have raised in total over 49 billion in debt and equity financing across North America. And it's from that perspective that we provide our comments today. I thought that we would start off with basically making some very, um, focusing on what the principles are relating to implementing, practically implementing minimum transfer capabilities and how we would do that and how to do that logistically and practically. First principle that we would recommend is that the principle of interregional planning should be in the context of Order 1000 regions as a foundation. That this should not be a national discussion about RTOs versus non-RTOs and minimum transfer capabilities between RTOs and non-RTOs. The discussion should be occurring about minimum transfer capabilities between Order 1000 regions, because that is the legal basis for regional planning. And we're talking about connecting regional planning between various regions that have been established. The second principle that we would suggest is that as we have a conversation about interregional planning, first, first, FERCs must first ensure that the regions, in fact, are electrically interconnected. And FERC must look individually at each of the Order 1000 regions to ensure that, in fact, these, the region itself is electrically interconnected. And then when there's discussions about what the interregional capability should be between the various regions, then in fact, we're actually having a conversation about interregional, true interregional transfer capabilities. Third principle, that FERC should build on the foundations in Order 1000, and meaning that regional planning trumps local planning and in a regional planning, Trump's regional planning. Fourth principle that we would suggest is that FERC should use an issue, a national rulemaking. And FERC should be the entity that establishes the minimum transfer capability between the Order 1000 regions. And when we're talking about minimum transfer capability, we are um, suggesting that that is defined as a percentage of peak load. We also suggest that the rulemaking, when it's established, should be focused first and foremost on FERC's legal framework for establishing the minimum transfer capability. We view that that legal framework is found under Section 215 of the Federal Power Act, and that FERC has the authority, based on reliability considerations, to bolster the interregional capabilities between the Order 1000s consistent with Section 215. FERC would need to make a finding that this interregional transfer capability is in the public interest and under all circumstances. So this means that in terms of looking at the public policy factors that would go into interregional transfer capabilities, that would need, FERC would have to be making a finding that the public policy factors are in and the requirements are in the public interest. And then we also believe that geographic zones and state and public and the local uh, public policy requirements um, could be suitable for helping FERC to establish the record for the minimum transfer capabilities. We are suggesting that FERC in the national rulemaking under principle five is establishing the legal basis for a minimum transfer capability. The ins and outs of what that specific percentage number is, we are suggesting that an ALJ proceeding at FERC would determine what that minimum transfer capability percentage is. 
and a proceeding, an ALJ proceeding with the Department of Energy and NREL closely involved in it that would be focused on what is the um, what is your number and what is your percent of peak load transfer. Principle six of this conversation is that clearly, by definition, this interregional transmission must be competitive. Um, under Order 1000, when there's cost allocation between two or more zones, that opens up the, the concepts and the important notions of competition. Clearly, with interregional projects, the cost would be shared by two or more zones, and therefore it's competitive. In addition, under Section 115, which 215, which is the basis for establishing interregional planning, that process must be not unduly discriminatory or preferential, and therefore that means competitive. Thank you for the opportunity to present these framework concepts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon, and thank you to all the panelists for your opening remarks. There's a lot of substance there, and I want to say that we appreciate your participation in today's panel. So let's jump into it with a question four from the supplemental notice. I think each panelist answer to this question will help frame the discussion as it tees up some threshold considerations. To help with the discussion, I want to describe a framework for grouping transmission providers that was introduced in the question. First is grouping A is the bilateral concept of all transmission providers in each pair of neighboring transmission planning regions. For example, New York ISO with ISO New England would be one pair. Second, grouping B is the broader concept of all transmission providers and all neighboring transmission planning regions for a single transmission planning region. For New York ISO, that would be New York ISO with ISO New England and PJM. The first part of Adria's presentation illustrated the differences between the bilateral grouping and the broader geographic grouping in the context of the Southeast. And then finally is uh, grouping C. It's the interconnection wide concept that would include all transmission providers within the same interconnection. So part A of question four asks who should determine the minimum amount of interregional transfer capability needed, assuming that there is such a need. Specifically, it asks what role should the commission or transmission providers in the bilateral grouping, the broader grouping of all transmission, of all neighboring transmission planning regions, or the interconnection wide grouping or other relevant entities play in determining what minimum amount of interregional transfer capability is needed, assuming that there is such a need. And then what are the advantages and disadvantages of different entities determining that minimum amount? So this question is open up to all the panelists. If you'd like to respond, please raise your hand and we'll call on you in turn. So I see Dr. Deborah Liu, you have your hand up. We can go to you first. Sure, thanks Matt. Uh, so um, I think C is, is the right answer. We all want affordability. The least cost answer is going to come from wider area planning. Um, during winter storm Uri, ERCOT shed 20,000 megawatts of burned load. Now you could build a 20,000 megawatt intertie between ERCOT and SPP, but recall SPP was already importing thousands of megawatts from ISO, who was already importing over twice as much from PJM. So you could see how a need between ERCOT and SPP might drive an even bigger need you know, out at the MISO PJM border as each affected region takes some power and passes the rest on. So in an ideal world, we'd have an entity at the interconnection level like WEC, who works directly with the regions and who in turn is informed by the national planning that DOE is undertaking now. So you'd start with the big picture planning, at least so you know how much money you're gonna leave on the table when you move down to maybe what's gonna be practical. And I can understand that maybe a practical reality like cost allocation might drive us to a bilateral approach. Um, and I'll just note, you know, in, in Europe, they split congestion rents between neighboring RTOs to finance the inter-RTO transmission. And that has yielded a lot of bilateral projects. Um, and to help deal with some of that, they've got a rule that 70% of those interconnectors have to be made available to the markets. So they also work on intra-regional uh, planning as, as well as the inter-regional planning. Great. Thank you, Debbie. Daryl, I see you have your hand up. If you'd like to answer the question. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I struggled a little bit uh, with the idea of, of NERC being the, 
you know, the standard setter for interregional transfer capability. Um, and I'm sort of thinking about this question because I don't typically think of, of interregional transfer capability as a reliability um, as a reliability benefit. And I think that's the problem um, that, you know, that we're all having, um, his, you know, we sort of, we think about the traditional way that the system is planned and we, and we think of interregional capability as sort of a convenience. Um, but I don't think that that's the way that we should be thinking going forward. Um, you know, it does have those sort of hourly and daily benefits that, um, that Debbie mentioned in her, in her opening remarks. Um, but it's not just a matter of economics going forward, especially, um, you know, in a, in a grid that's, that's primarily, um, you know, being powered by renewable resources. And so here's, I actually think NERC may be the right forum, uh, which I think, you know, doesn't necessarily misalign with, with Debbie's position. It's um, more along the lines of like, how do you, not only do, how do you set the standard, but how do you sort of hold people uh, accountable to the standard? Um, as we think about the grid as an enabler for renewable resources and recognize the intermittent nature, we have, we have to start thinking about how to share those resources. And, um, you know, and I think it becomes a reliability issue at some point in the future as we get to the higher levels uh, of renewables. Um, and if you think about FERC as, you know, as the entity, for instance, um, sort of setting the requirement, there's a lot of folks that are not FERC jurisdictional. And so you start to have uh, sort of equity issues, um, you know, to, to some of the remarks that, that uh, Aaron uh, mentioned in his opening. So I do, I do tend to think that NERC is the right, is the right uh, entity to sort of set the standards. Okay, appreciate that perspective. David Kelly, I see you have your hand up. Would you like to also respond to the question? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, I, when it comes to actually setting a um, minimum interregional transfer capability amount, I struggle with the notion that there's any one top-down um, organization or, or entity who's best suited to come up with a number. I think, as we saw from uh, Dr. Brooks' presentation uh, at the beginning of the, the, the panel, um, I think first and foremost, we need to come up with a common understanding of what it is that we're even trying to measure and what are we going to set a requirement against. Um, and that's where I actually think the commission could come in uh, and have a role to play is setting the um, the, the the a common understanding of of what minimum oh, I'm sorry what transfer capability even is and then how you measure it because it's not as simple as adding up the tie line capabilities uh, between two entities or two planning regions um, there are a number of other uh, constraints that could exist within a given uh, planning region that could be as much a barrier to moving energy across an interconnection or between planning regions as anything else. So I think, however, a minimum interregional transfer capability uh, requirement is, is established, there's going to have to be some sort of a blend between a top-down coordination effort and just level setting and then a bottoms up approach of actually determining what the factors are that need to go into setting that requirement and then how you measure it. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Sharon, you have your hand up. Would you like to respond or answer it differently? Yes. Yes, I would. Um, I would just like to, to point out for um, purposes of this discussion that LS Power in our um, ANOPA reply comments on page 68 of those comments specifically address this issue when we stated that the commission, and it is FERC in our view that does this, that the commission unquestionably has the legal authority to order a minimum transfer capability between regions. And we stated that under section 215 of the Federal Power Act, it gives the commission great statutory latitude to address a variety of issues related to reliable operation of the bulk power system. Specifically, it states that the commission may approve by rule or order a proposed reliability standard or modification to a reliability standard if it determines that the standard is just, reasonable, not unduly discriminatory or preferential, and in the public interest. And we think it's on that language that FERC should stand and set the, the standard. 
thank you very much, Sharon, and I appreciate the site to your comments, uh, specifically the page number or paragraph number. Laura, I see you have your hand up. Would you like to respond? Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. So you'll hear very similar things to what Deborah said and um, what David said from a MISO perspective. I do think it's worthwhile to draw a differentiation between what we should evaluate versus what needs a minimum requirement. Um, the, the complexities of creating a minimum requirement, as noted before, it's not so simple to add up tie lines. Um, it's not a contractual firm service discussion. But the, the benefit of evaluating and looking at different things cannot be understated. And I'll go back to Winter Storm Uri too. Um, we've talked several times about the transfers of power from PJM through MISO into SVP. Those were actually limited by an element on a third party system in TVA. So that does illustrate the value of looking more broadly, um, simply looking at transfers between MISO and PJM or MISO and SVP would have resulted in, um, wouldn't have caught the constraint that ended up binding and limiting our system. So at the end of the day, what we do think is that as we talk about interregional transfer, we really have to look at and evaluate um, all options for system benefits. Great, thank you, I appreciate that distinction. Saad, I see you have your hand up as well. Would you like to respond? Yes. Uh Thank you. And hopefully my sound is coming okay now. All right. Yeah, Great. Yeah. All right. So I think uh, one of the things I want, want to mention is that it's important to understand the, the complexity or the, the, the nuance of the requirement. What does it mean to require a minimum interregional transfer capability? Are we talking about a megawatt number or are we talking about a certain performance standard? And there's, there's a difference between those two. Um, calculating a number in, in some instances may be uh, practical or, or, or meaningful, but in some instances it may not be. And it depends on how the regions are set up. Um, in an RTO region type of region where the RTO operates as a single balancing authority, and then you have another RTO region that is also a balancing authority, and then you have some transmission between those two regions, that's a different uh, situation. Whereas if you have a region that is comprised of, uh, that, that, that connects to another region in a more of a Swiss cheese manner, and then you have uh, different balancing authorities uh, uh, in different regions. And, and because at the end of the day, the physics of the system are going to uh, dictate where the flows occur. And, and, and what I mean by that is that where, where is the, the, the gap in terms of, of or shortage of resources, what part of the system is experiencing that, that constraint, and then which part of the system has those additional resources. And, and that physics of the system is eventually going to dictate how the flows occur between regions. So I think those those are some of the things that that are important, and that that will then drive what entities are then involved in in doing the analysis and 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 calculating. I mean, if it's, if it's a calculation, calculating what that that minimum amount uh, should be. Great, thank you, Saad. I want to turn to part B of question four about the commission's role. But before I do that. I think Saad asked a great question about how to measure interregional transfer capability, what the requirement is. And Adria's presentation talked a little bit about two different ways to measure interregional transfer capability. So before moving on to part B, question four, I'm curious from the panelists if you have any thoughts on the best way to measure interregional transfer capability. And if you do, you know, feel free to raise your hand. Adria, see so you have your hand up. Yes, yeah, so I can provide a little bit more context there and what we did or what I found while looking at these numbers. So just to name it, there's um, several different ways to do this. I put in two in my presentation, but I also want to note that NERC has three different standards by which they calculate um, available transfer or transfer capability. And for the audience to know, um, 
in addition to those slides, I did submit supplemental documentation and actually list what those NERC standards are. So those are out there and available. Um, those are an existing template for how to calculate this. But notably, the, the different regions are allowed regional flexibility in which ones they choose between those three definitions when they have to calculate these. So even though there are existing standards, there's still this comparison of apples to oranges. So just an added thing to note onto there. Thanks. Thank you, Adria. Sharon, you have your hand up. Like sure, I would just sure I would just mention that um, we believe that the minimum transfer capability should be established as a percentage of peak load, um, and that should be the basis for the discussion on what it should be. And we also believe that it should be between the order one thousand regions. So we're talking about a percentage of peak load and transfer capabilities between the order one thousand regions. We don't see um, a basis for being able to establish um, minimum transfer capabilities between the RTOs and non-RTOs. We don't think that's the right um, con construct, that it's uh, more appropriate between the Order 1000 regions. Okay, thank you for that. Aaron Bloom, I see you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. So uh, just wanted to echo a little bit of what Adria said. We do have some good, helpful guidance from NERC, though standardization of having one methodology that could be applied to all regions so we have an apples to apples comparison would be very valuable. Um, whether or not the percentage on peak load is the right metric, I think there's um, a variety of methods that could be used. Uh, one risk about using a peak load metric only is that the periods of risk might not be during peak load. They could be in other seasons of the year. And so wouldn't want to incorrectly uh, guide us towards that role. Maybe you do winter and a summer peak as an alternative. Great. Thank you, Aaron. So with that, I'd like to move to part B of question four about the commission's role. More specifically, should the commission establish a formula or planning process or instead more general criteria, guidelines, or principles for transmission providers to follow in establishing a minimum interregional transfer capability requirement? And I know some of you have answered this question in your opening statements, so feel free to summarize that briefly. Um, question is, you know, how, what do you see as the commission's role as one prescribing a specific process, formula, or more general principles? And this is open up to all panelists. And after that discussion, we can turn to um, how the minimum amount might be defined and any principles that would inform the minimum amount. So Aaron, go back to you. Great, thank you. I think the unique role that the commission has to play here is in setting up the process and also identifying the metrics that can be done universally. Um, I think that's a very clear role in terms of how the regions can fulfill that role. I think they should each be responsible for calculating the risk. We propose the correlated force outage risk. There's a variety of actions that they could take that could help minimize that risk to some degree. But the FERC should be very clear on here's the process for fulfilling that and here are the metrics that we're gonna measure you on. All right, thank you so much, Aaron. David Kelly, I see you have your hand up as well. What's the answer? Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, what Aaron said. I, I think the commission establishing um, a, a common definition of what it is that we're even trying to establish when it comes to transfer capability. So not, in a lot of ways, regional flexibility is very good and it should be afforded. But I think to ensure that we are uh, comparing apples to apples and measuring the benefits and the value of of one apple to another across the uh, the, the country or or particular interconnections, I think the commission has a really important role to play in standardization uh, when it comes to uh, defining the uh, the transfer capability and and how you measure it. And then I think I agree with Aaron as well. In in some fashion, how uh, how each of the individual utility providers are measuring their um, um, their, their compliance with whatever that requirement might be. Thank you. Appreciate that perspective. David, I see Debbie has her hand up. Would you like to respond to the question? Yes, thanks, Matt. Um, I think if we use a cost benefit analysis planning approach, then you want to make sure you're looking at total benefits compared to total costs compared to some threshold. And ideally, you're looking at all benefits similar to what we did in our multi-value transmission planning report or how MISO does the LRTP. Um, the other approach I think that's being discussed is an insurance-based approach, risk mitigation for resilience events, where you're going to look at potential extreme events over the long-term future that would drive emergency conditions based on some future resource mix and future load 
which case you're determining all of the impacts, looking at fuel supply, load impacts, and, and everything, and then deciding how much do you want to mitigate these impacts. It's going to be really hard to place dollar values on that. I think um, you know, during emergency conditions, value of lost load on the third day of an outage, you know, that's extreme because you may be talking about life and death situations. But um, but that risk mitigation is is another way to do this. Great. Thank you for that. And thanks for those answers. Any other thoughts on the commission's role in establishing a formula or planning process or instead marginal criteria, guidelines or principles for transmission providers to follow, establishing a minimum interregional transfer capability requirement? Not seeing any other panelists interested in answering that question. I can turn to question one from the supplemental notice, which is a higher level question about what principles should be used to establish a minimum amount of interregional transfer capability. I think you can think of these principles as principles to inform a planning process or the development of specific criteria. The notice gives as an example, the principle that a minimum interregional transfer capability requirement would be determined based on the relative cost to transmission customers of the loss of load during an extreme event. I know um, Sharon, you mentioned some principles at the beginning of of this panel, but I'm curious uh, what other principles could be used to inform a minimum interregional transfer capability requirement. David, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, it's been mentioned by a couple of my fellow panelists um, a, a few times already, but I think I agree with the notion of common modes of failure and more widespread um, issues being a consideration in establishing a, a, an appropriate amount of transfer capability. Um, one of the things I, I am somewhat concerned about in this discussion is I don't want any sort of requirement for maintaining uh, interregional transfer capability to be a replacement uh, for what each of the individual um, regions are already required to do. I think the um, the, the robust operations and coordination practices and, and you know, adhering to NERC standards that each of the planning coordinators and each of the balance and authorities already have to maintain do a really good job of addressing the issues that they're intended to address, right? When it comes to um, being able to replace the loss of the largest generator and SPP, that's replacement of the largest plus half of the next generator. Those types of things, um, should should continue and not we shouldn't be able to just point to oh well I can count on being able to import energy from my neighbor and therefore I don't need to maintain my you know existing requirements whether it's resource adequacy or uh, operating reserves or what have you um, so just generally I think the regional requirements should continue um, and that the interregional trans uh, transfer capability should almost be a supplement to what we are already required to do as a region. I appreciate you adding some color to how the processes might work together. Asad, I see you have your hand up. Would you like to add yeah. some principles? Yeah, I think one of the things that's important to consider in this regard is um, really understanding um, what is causing that that uh, constraint transfer. Um, so, for example, if it is a, a an extreme event or a, a heat wave or, or, or cold snap, whatever the case may be, what is the, 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 the underlying issue here? Is it a, because, because there's a resource um, uh, component to transfers as well. You have to have enough resources to be able to maintain certain transfers. So one of the things to consider would be what is the, the underlying uh, issue that, that is causing those constrained transfers? Is it really a resource issue or is it a, a transmission that's constrained? Okay, so to be clear, you're saying one of the principles would be able to separate those two things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like what's 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 really causing the constraint? I mean, if it is a, if it's, if, if there aren't enough resources to, to um, to uh, sustain the required amount of transfer in order to meet the energy needs, then adding more transmission is is just not going to help. Great. Thank you for that perspective. Aaron Bloom, I see you have your hand up. 
Great, thank you. So um, there are two principles from my point of view that need to be focused on. They are equity and transparency. You get those by having an easily calculatable and identifiable metric. I think we need to clearly identify the risk that the commission is trying to mitigate here and then identify the benefits associated with mitigating those risks. Uh, we don't need to have another, you know, principle-based future where we're trying to come up with ways to encourage planning. I think we either identify this risk and we have events that can justify it um, and, and move on from there. Great. Thank you, Aaron. And Laura, would you like to respond this time? Laura, you might have frozen. Do you have a connection problem? Okay, we can come back to Laura once her connection problem is resolved. Um, thanks for all those answers about principles. Um, I, I think we can uh, turn back to thinking about the bilateral, broader, and interconnection-wide groupings of transmission providers. And I think um, it would be good to have a discussion on whether or not those principles being considered for establishing a minimum amount of interregional transfer capability be consistent for the groupings, or does it make sense to have principles vary according to the, the grouping? Okay. Interested in panelists answer to that question. Uh, Daryl, I see you have your hand up and you might be going back to the principles. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was actually trying to look for the reaction button. I was going to um, just mention um, briefly on David's point on the last um, on the last question, the last sort of sub part of the question um, around sort of meeting your internal reserves and operating reserves requirements and resource adequacy requirements. Um, yeah, I, I actually totally 100% agree with them. Um, but I also think that you can you can sort of uh, overlap these. In a, in a strategic way as well, you know, such that you meet your your interregional transfer capability requirements, but you know uh, that capability can be used, you know, explicitly by load serving entities within a, a given region to meet their resource adequacy needs, for instance, and in contract over medium or long term periods, uh, without having to say, okay, now we need to go out and you know procure additional interregional capability. Um, so that that would suggest that you can you have you know additional usage. Um, and I think there's plenty of examples of that uh, with with California, for instance, in, in relying on, you know, external resource adequacy uh, capability and in ISO New England. Great. So maybe uh, if if Laura is available, you can. <laughs> I think I think Laura that. might be back. Yep. Yeah. Yes, uh, and my apologies. I might be operating under an N minus three condition at this point for the uh, electrical engineers in the audience. Um, so when. I started out the discussion talking about the um, principles that we use in our regional planning, which a large portion is really based on a foundation of making sure that we have consensus around policy, business case, and cost allocation recovery. Um, as Chair Pride Moore said in the last panel, it bears stating that the minimum isn't necessarily a static number and the value of interregional cap capability may vary depending on who you're talking to, more in line with an insurance policy that some people may choose to get the gold standard and others may not. So we don't wanna imply that there's a strict percentage increase that would be most valuable. It really has to come down to enabling and defining a business case and what the value of the transmission is. And that can come forward in multiple different ways, depending on the region and depending on what each region values. Great. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Appreciate that perspective. And I'd like to turn back to whether or not these principles should be common uh, across different regions. And um, particularly, I think there's a question on the supplemental notice about whether or not there should um, be a, you know, should the establishment of a minimum amount of interregional transfer capability for non-RTO regions differ than for RTO regions? And, um, and you know, this could tie back into whether or not it should vary across different groups working together. So Sharon, I see you have your hand up. Sure. Um, from LS Power's perspective, we think that a minimum a transfer capability is applying to the country and applying to all of the order 1000 regions. We're talking about 
establishing what the minimum transfer capability is between the order 1000 regions and um, certainly a region could justify on the basis of state public policy requirements perhaps that number could be higher um, in that situation but we're talking about minimum transfer capabilities between order 1000 regions i'm very much struggle with how you would do that in in uh discriminating between rtos and non-rtos in terms of um, some sort of minimum transfer capability requirement um, it really doesn't make a lot of legal sense in terms of if you think about how order 1000 was set up and order 1000 never differentiate it between RTOs and non-RTOs in terms of requiring for regional planning. And so the question is why all of a sudden for our inter-regional planning, are you discriminating between RTOs versus non-RTOs? And it's if you're gonna if it's if it's going to be a national rule, it needs to be in the context of the Order 1000 regions. And um, the the issue between non-RTOs and RTOs was already addressed in Order 1000. It never made that separation or distinction. Great, thank you, Sharon. Appreciate that perspective. David Kelly, I see you've got your hand up. I'd like to respond. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I think if we all start from the premise that transfer capability, at least as we're talking about it here in terms of maintaining a minimum, is intended to help preserve reliability and enhance resiliency then I don't think it makes sense to um, sort of discriminate or differentiate uh, between RTO and non-RTO regions from, from that perspective. So I think any sort of uh, uh, the establishment of a requirement, and as I've already mentioned, how you measure transfer capability, I think all of those should be pretty standard. With that said, I do think there um, is a lot of room for recognition of regional differences. And I know uh, Laura just spoke about it in terms of risk uh, and insurance policies that not every region has the same sort of risk. We all have different fuel mixes. Our um, evolution, the speed at which our fuel mix is changing, um, the risk of severe weather and the loss of, uh, of generation across uh, each of our regions is not the same. So I do think there needs to be some flexibility allowed to recognize the differences in those risks. But just for the notion of, you know, maintaining reliability and in, enhancing resiliency from being able to um, provide assistance to each other, I think that should apply pretty universally. Great. Thank you so much, David. And Samin, We'll start a discussion in a second about the drivers of the need for interregional transfer capability, and we can talk about that then. But first, Daryl, you have your hand up. Would you like to respond to the question? Yeah, just uh, really briefly on this uh, this topic. Um, the you know I think the answer to the question really depends on the drivers to, to what you know Dave Kelly said, and um, I think the word interregional is forcing us to think about sort of our traditional views of what a region is. Uh, and it almost sort of makes us ignore the fact that even a specific like parent investor owned utility like Southern Company or AEP who has a very large footprint of operating companies and diverse needs across those operating footprints may require, you know, almost a more state uh, or even section of a state uh, review of the risks of loss of supply to demand customers and during extreme events. And so, you know, if we so if, if we take a traditional view of a region in my extension, an existing region, a region could reduce or eliminate the need to meet some sort of interregional transfer capability by just joining an RTO, which I don't think is what the intent of this discussion is, um, or what the standard might be. So, I, you know, in a nutshell, I don't, I don't think we should have a differentiation between a re an RTO region or a non-RTO region, and we should probably start fi figuring out what the what the word region means as it relates to transfer capability here. Great, thank you. I know there are some perspectives on that. Um, reserve perspective here. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for their answers to the questions so far. I um, will now um, turn to Samin to facilitate the remaining questions. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, panelists, um, for the wonderful discussion so far. Uh, I, think, uh, I think we can turn to question two of the supplemental notice now. We've touched on principles. We've We've touched on uh, a number of things 
uh, surrounding those principles. Um, but this question kind of lists a number of factors. I'm going to list them now, historical or projected extreme events, load and resource diversity, changes in resource mix and demand, improved reliability, avoided production costs, geographic zones, the option value of transfer transmission facilities, and increased operator flexibility. Um, so what I want to hear from panelists is to what extent, if any, should those factors or other factors be considered when establishing a minimum interregional transfer capability requirement? And I see Aaron has his hand raised, and then we'll, we'll go to Debbie right after that. Great, thank you. I think monitoring historic uh, resilience events or extreme weather events is the key metric that needs to be evaluated here. Um, other things that should be considered are uh, whether the fact that we don't have any plan at all today. So we need to scale up some plan about the future, whether that's disaggregated or a centrally planned one. We need some rolled up um, calculus that can tell us what is the historic level of risk and apply some safety margin on top of that. Whether or not we should use a probabilistic method going forward, those are very difficult to go calculate and susceptible to a lot of your input assumptions. I think a historical based approach um, is probably the preferred route. Thank you, Aaron, and especially given your your earlier comments about uh, not not uh, not needing a principle based future, that's that's really helpful. Thank you, and and uh, and you do have um, uh, comments on the record in uh, on our website, so they should be posted now. Uh, so let's turn to Debbie. I think she has her hand raised. Sure. Thanks, Samin. So uh, we want to consider it all, but the weather, as Aaron just said, the loads and what future loads are going to look like and the generation and what future generation is going to look like and including fuel supplies are the critical starting point. And if we had a good way to project climate impacts on future weather tail events, we would use that. But if you don't have that, and I don't think we have that right now, you might just use historical worst case weather because with climate change, these records are likely going to get beaten within the lifetime of new transmission facilities. And also, like Dev said, much of the modeling that we are doing doesn't consider forecast errors of load, wind, and solar. You know, for example, that doesn't get considered in capacity expansion models. That doesn't get considered often in resource adequacy models. Um, those forecast errors are going to be increasingly important. And then finally, we're not good at foreseeing all of the potential threats and all of the potential common mode forced outage type things that may be happening in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Debbie. Moving on to Laura. Thanks, Samin. Um, when we talk about the complexities and the nuances of planning for a transfer capability, um, I think you do have to recognize that they vary widely depending on system conditions. And that's why in large part, MISO thinks that this has to be a joint operational and transmission planning solution. Uh, we will not be able to predict where the next hurricane Laura will happen or when the next Arctic event will happen. We can predict that there will be something of that nature, but we don't wanna set ourselves in a paradigm where we're trying to craft our best crystal ball and pretend that we can see exactly what the future will. So we do have to make sure that we have um, while we learn from the past, that we recognize that the future is hazy. Um, with that, we can look at some things th like transmission outages, generation outages, um, even improved reliability. All of these can feed into benefits, but try making sure that it's looked at from possibilities or what the future may be rather than what the future will be, will be critical to making sure that we have a reputable base case to at the end of the day. Thank you so much, Laura. Let's move on to David. Thanks, Samin. I think we can all agree that, you know, transmission can positively impact every one of these, these factors. But as I said in my opening remarks, I think we need to make sure that we leverage as much as possible our existing planning processes that already consider a number of these factors, things like avoided production costs, right? Most of us already include factors like that in our regional and interregional planning processes. But because, and I think Daryl mentioned this earlier, 
transmission providing all these different values, th those values should be stacked to consider what's the right transmission. Are, are we optimizing the solutions to meet all of these needs rather than just increasing interregional transfer capability as an example? So I think the notion of increasing transfer capability itself should be considered in the context of our existing planning processes so that we don't have this sort of overlapping or competing demands for finding what the right transmission is. Thank you, David. Moving on to Saad. Yeah, thanks, Amin. I think um, it's important that we learn from the past and, and the historical events that, that have happened and, and uh, look at the probabilities. But I think it's also important to look at the plausibility as well going into the future. Uh, and, and there's some, some element to that as well that, that should be considered. Um, as, as Laura was mentioning, then that, you know, there's a lot of haze and uncertainty for the future, especially, you know, in the West, we've seen transmission projects taking 10, 15, sometimes, you know, more than that to, to build. Um, getting loads and, and to, your, to your point about, you know, loads and resource diversity, I think it's important to not think of it in, in terms of just trying to predict what the future will look like, but what are the different futures that we may experience as a system and then trying to plan for that uh, in the future and, and, and looking at what, what solutions best serve those various different future needs uh, as they play out. Thank you so much. Uh, unless there are any other panelists looking to um, weigh in on this, I'm gonna move on to question three of the supplemental notice, if that's okay. Seeing none. Um, so now, now that we're on the subject of, criteria, of what criteria should be considered, um, should planning criteria other than reliability and resilience be considered in establishing a minimum inter-regional inter transfer capability requirement? Aaron? So I think there's a variety of metrics that could be used to establish the requirement, but I think the consensus that we have across the industry about focusing on the reliability and the resilience helps us address the historic underinvestment of transmission on a common set of areas that almost all stakeholders agree are critically important. So while we certainly could go above and beyond that, and I wouldn't want to preclude any region from in, uh, including additional considerations, I think they set the appropriate floor. Thank you, Aaron. I see uh, Laura, and then right after Laura, we'll uh, go to David. Thank you, Samin. Um, reliability will, and resilience will always be the bread and butter of planning for interregional capability. This is transmission that's intended to go and, and help us when during our sometimes literal darkest hours to keep the lights on during these extreme events. But I do think that we'd be remiss if we don't set up a framework that really focuses equally on the, the benefits. So those are required to make sure that this transmission actually gets built and the best electrical solution is the one that you can get built at the end of the day. Um, some of these benefits have been mentioned before. We've talked about uh, resource adequacy and how transmission can have resource adequacy benefits, um, certainly in making sure capacity is delivered. Um, we also talked about in our long range transmission planning the value of transmission in serving as that insurance policy and reducing your risk of load shed. That is an extreme benefit that has ex dollar impacts that are really critical for us to think about. So while reliability is important, the number of mitigated contingencies is important, we need to make sure that we also look at this from a uh, financial and qualitative and quantitative benefit metric. Thank you, Laura. I see David, and then uh, right after David, we'll go to Debbie. Yeah, when I look at this question, it's specific to what criteria should apply to establishing the requirement. And so when I think about that, I think re reliability and resilience has to be at the heart of that if you're going to mandate it. Um, as I mentioned in my, the, the response to the last question, we all know transmission provides lots of value, lots of benefits, 
but there's only so much benefit that certain uh, customer bases believe is worth paying for. And I think at the end of the day, we have to also appreciate the fact that transmission is a very expensive uh, capital intensive business. And somebody alluded to this in their opening remarks about how transmission is becoming a larger and larger part of a ratepayers bill. Um, if we were just talking about establishing a process by which we were making sure we were selecting the right transmission projects, you know, I could add a whole bunch more criteria to this. But if it's specific to mandating that we have a re requirement to maintain transfer capability and that we build transmission to get there, I almost think you have to stay in the realm of reliability and resiliency because that's just something that's at the heart of um, you know, us as a country and, and how we, you know, uh, save lives, to be honest with you, as we've seen recently. Um, so I think we've got to be a little careful as if we get outside the bounds of that when we're talking about main, um, establishing a requirement. Thank you, David. Debbie? Um, I don't have an opinion on whether we should or should not include economic benefits, but just to say that whether you do or you don't, you're still going to recognize economic benefits and normal market operations every day, hour to hour. You're going to get it anyway. So you might as well calculate it and you might as well let the public and stakeholders know that you're getting these economic benefits for the overall system, you know, to the ratepayers at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Oh, it looks like Aaron, um, you wanted to follow up. Yeah, I just wanted to build a little bit on what Debbie said there on the importance of the fact that that transmission procured for addressing resilience should be available for the economic transactions as well. And so this isn't just capacity that we want to sit and hold on the, all the time. We want to be able to release that to the market because oftentimes these events can on, take place over many hours or many days, and we don't want to just hold it for sudden events. Sudden event risks like contingency risks are well planned for on the system today. These uncorrelated risks are not planned for today. And that's what we need to be looking out for. And I think um, really agree with Debbie that if you build towards the reliability and resilience, you're going to get an awful lot of these economic benefits. And that's a unique characteristic, I would say, of interregional transmission specifically. Thank you, Aaron. I, I should note, uh, please, please feel free to do the back and forth. We're uh, definitely looking for a, a robust conversation. So um, thank you for that, Aaron. Um, uh, Sharon? Yeah, I would just add that at the end of the day, we think it's FERC and NERC that have the ability under Section 115 to establish what that minimum transfer capability is and what the reliability standards are. But it's not to say that um, FERC in the rulemaking and NERC couldn't provide a mechanisms for regions to increase the minimum transfer capability if there were state or federal public policy requirements. Um, and that might could be a feature of it. Um, but at the end of the day, at this point, we are operating in a world of state public policy requirements versus federal requirements. And so um, it there would have to be some sort of flexibility in there to account for different states have different requirements. At the end of the day, you have to have a rule that can be legally sustained. And it's clear under Section 215 that it's FERC that has to set that standard. For sure. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Daryl? Yeah, thanks. I mean, um, <clears throat> I guess the only thing that I would add, um, and I said I'm 100 percent aligned with with, with Aaron uh, and with David on, you know, it really should be focused on reliability and resiliency. Um, the only thing I'd add is, you know, when and one of the one of the concerns I have with adding sort of uh, production cost savings, for instance, is that it becomes the sort of focal point uh, of everybody. You know, and like, well, you know, how much are we really saving ratepayers with this transmission? And I don't, I don't think that's the intent uh, of of a minimum transfer capability, interregional transfer capability. Um, you know, it certainly will become part of the discussion around, you know, this versus that. You know, when you're looking at different uh, opportunities to meet your minimum or to enhance, you know, your your capability to to get to to achieve your minimum. You know, uh, the other sort of stacking benefits will become part of the discussion. Um, the the issue is that, you know, like if we're really focusing on 
minimizing risk and looking at it primarily as an insurance policy and then only secondarily, you know, for all the other benefits that we will, we expect because we just, we're all in this business and we know what transmission does. Um, you know, we should really just be focusing on like, you know, here's a wildfire risk. Let's build transmission in this area that, you know, doesn't have the same risk, right? That kind of stuff first and only look at those other value stacks, um, you know, once we've sort of identified the right way to, you know, to, to meet our insurance needs, so to speak. Thank you, Daryl. That reminds me, maybe we can turn to uh, just a quick follow-up question. I want to hear from any panelists that, that are willing to take this question. Uh, one of the questions from Adria's presentation was what metrics best quantify resilience improvements offered by interregional transfer capacity? Um, and she lists a few coincident uh, forced outages, value of lost load, resource adequacy re reserve margins. Uh, could any of you uh, possibly touch on that? Aaron. You could probably also add uh, reductions in expected unserved energy to the list. That would be in line with resource adequacy metrics that um, Dr. Brooks identified. Thank you, Laura. So I do think that there are a number of metrics and what we found in um, defining metrics is that there's value in capturing the reliability benefits. You have tend to have to have those to show the value when you're building an estate um, that there's direct benefits. Production cost is obviously high up there for any markets, um, but even getting into the, the avoided risk of load shed primarily reliability, but also quantified. So I do think that there's ways that you can quantify a number of benefits. And we, we do focus quite a bit on that at MISO to make sure that while everyone might not agree with each benefit we have, we have benefits that people can agree with and can understand what we're doing. Thank you so much for bearing with us here. Oh, David, looks like you uh, have your hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I just uh, had a, a thought pop into my my head there. Um, when it comes to measuring reliability and resilience, one of the um, topics that I think we as an industry just generally understand, but we haven't done a really good job of defining is value of lost load. And that's something that um, I know some regions have taken a stab at at defining, and it's almost hard to even think about, right? What's the what's the economic value? What sort of price tag do you put on potentially turning somebody's lights out? And in a time right now where I think we look across the country and most of the lights are on, you know, we come up with one answer, but during a severe event like what we saw in February of last year, I think most people would probably say that number is much larger. So I, I'd, I'd love to come up with a way, and I don't know if this is, you know, with FERC leadership or, you know, through some sort of a, a NERC effort or industry-led effort, come up with some sort of a common approach that most stakeholders could agree on as to how you actually value reliability and resilience through some sort of a calculation of value of loss load. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, I just want to echo what um, David just said, that value of loss load is a very deep and thorny issue that does require a lot of research from industry. And I would second the need for someone to take some leadership on that. And also that when we did our analysis of interregional transmission, um, uh, we looked not just at value of loss load, but you can also look at you know duration of outages too. It's not just the magnitude, but the duration. And, and as I mentioned before, you know, the value of loss load for your first tower of an outage is really different from when it's on your third, second, or third day of an outage. So um, the reducing the duration through an original transmission is another really big benefit. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, thank you all uh, who answered that question and bearing with us with our uh, with our back and forth questions here. Um, and anytime I hear uh, someone should take leadership as a FERC staffer, I. I I'm required to write that down. So uh, um, moving on, I, I think um, I want to circle back to um, to principles, the, the, the idea of principles. So um, if you're looking at existing 
commission approved transmission planning regions. Some consist of one balancing authority and others consist of several balancing authorities, right? Uh, uh, several balancing authority areas, right? So uh, should there be a difference in how a minimum inter-regional transfer capability requirement should be identified in this basis, on this basis uh, between those two different types of um, regions or um, a difference in principles or, um, or any other thoughts? Aaron. I think you run into a lot of risk when you start to have differentiation in the principles among the regions and standardization is going to allow us to take that wide area of view about what is the projected risk. So that's why I've tried to identify, you know, one metric that every system is, is faced with, which is a common mode failure rate. Every region can take some action to help mitigate that to some extent. They can winterize their facilities. They can take other action, but that interregional transmission really helps you get resources that are truly diverse. Thank you, Aaron. Would any other panelists care to espouse on that? Oh, it looks like Saad. Yeah, I think I think there might be a way. I mean, given that that there's so much diversity in in how the regions operate across the country, uh, in in RTOs and non RTOs, maybe there is a way to create some kind of flexibility in terms of how this is calculated. That could be one possibility. <laughs> In the sense that you know, when we talk about the the uh, minimum interregional transfer capability, maybe it's it's not a transfer capability that's measured across all the transmission that connects to areas of the system or the two you know uh, regions. Maybe it's across the the there's some flexibility there that allows for a transfer capability where it's 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 needed uh, for the for the system conditions that are being studied between the two two regions in other words it's very localized and specific to the transmission that's going to provide the benefit that that we're looking for as opposed to a straight out you know going from one region to another and then all the transmission in between Thank you so much, Saad. I appreciate those thoughts. Um, sorry, the, these uh, these panels are definitely long. Um, I, I I appreciate that that we're uh, we're trucking through here. No no break, unfortunately. Uh, we're, we're we're pressing on. Um, so I, I want to turn to question five from the supplemental notice, and uh, that's about uh, merchant transmission facilities. So how um, how should merchant transmission facility developers and public utility transmission providers uh, conducting transmission planning avoid planning duplicative or conflicting transmission facilities to increase interregional transfer capability. Uh, several panelists want to answer this one, so we'll start with uh, Daryl. Thanks, I mean, and this is kind of near and dear to my heart, uh, given my opening remarks with some, you know, fairly large interregional transmission projects um, that Pattern Energy is is, is developing. Um, did I think the ability to increase um, regional, as I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, even even just between states within within an RTO, for instance, so sort of the, the, the ability to add um, or increase regional or interregional transfer capability um, it really could be added as a metric and another benefit metric. And I think some, you know, some of the RTOs that, that do um, sort of longer term planning already look at uh, transfer capability uh, as a benefit metric. Um, and so you can add that as one for, you know, in the FERC order 1000 windows, uh, for example. Um, and furthermore, you know, projects that are that are, you know, in merchant transmission projects in which by definition are, are typically funded by the developer. Um, could also, you know, provide some of those benefits and could be pointed to, you know, once they meet some some milestone of certainty, um, you know, that the region uh, needs to see in order to be able to point to them. And then maybe there's some value that can be attributed to that um, uh, in order to sort of de-risk the, 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 those transmission facilities in some way uh, for low serving entities for, that might be beneficiaries of that of that of those projects. So I, I think you know, there's a way to, you know, to, to sort of point to, to mer merchant projects uh, and uh, and meet some of those requirements and, you know, to avoid du 
duplication, you know, just making sure that if you have an order 1000 window, for instance, that you're, you're properly identifying that as a, as a, a potential benefit, you know, so that folks are, are looking at, you know, all the sort of stack benefits they can provide in a, you know, in their proposals to those order 1000 processes. Look at that. Thank you, Gerald. Let's move to Laura. Thank you. Um, so whenever you talk about how do you do transmission planning well, and this is where I might steal Aaron's thunder, um, transparency is key. You can't get through this without talking to each other. You can't do it without processes where people know when their input will be um, well received and how to give that. So on a regular basis, um, just to get through our annual planning process, MISA holds over 75 stakeholder meetings, workshops, group, working groups, annually, just to make sure that we have the right voices in our planning process. Um, this can range from the sub-regional planning meetings where we have at least three meetings for each of our four sub-regions to review uh, localized projects to our long range transmission plan where we held over 200 internal and external meetings to get towards that uh, tranche one approval. So we have to make sure that we have the right forums where people can come and talk through these. Um, the numbers I just gave were for a quote unquote simple regional process. The voices that we'll need to consider for interregional um, go far beyond that. Appreciate that. Thank you, Laura. Aaron? Laura, I, I absolutely agree with you. Trans Transparency is key, and I think that's one of the, the, the gaping holes that we have for interregional transmission today, um, and even for merchant transmission. Right now, there's not a process or a place for merchant transmission projects to be evaluated along with these others. And if you bring your own IP, you bring your own idea to the planning process today, there's a risk that you could lose it as a merchant, where somebody else could take your idea and be approved to build it. So we need a place where these merchant ideas can be brought to light and evaluated. And if that's part of the MITSI process or another integrated planning process, um, we would be you know, more than happy to see that happen. But right now, there's no place to have it done. And I think that's a problem that needs to be rectified uh, by the commission because we don't have any planning of any type today at that scale. Thank you, Aaron. Debbie? So I live out in the West and in the West, I think WEC is the obvious entity to implement a longer time horizon regional planning process. Um, you know, about a decade, 15 years ago with the DOE ARA funded transmission expansion planning process, we undertook a very large stakeholder transparent process. And um, I think if FERC were to call for an interregional transfer capability, it could direct WEC to coordinate and manage uh, the planning of interregional lines and provide oversight, consistent data methodologies, um, coordination to the order of 1,000 regions. Thanks. Thank you, Debbie. Laura? Um, apologies, but Debbie's comments made me think of one other thing. Uh, there are endless meetings that you can go to to discuss many of these topics. I think it's incredibly important that we think about how we integrate interregional with existing planning processes. Um, it doesn't make sense just to have a new set of studies that stack on and stand by themselves because we really have to think about how to do this in a cohesive manner. That includes the engineering studies, but it also includes the forums where we're listening to voices. Uh, we're facing a lot of challenges coming up with the extreme weather we're seeing with the need to build transmission. So we have to make sure that we have all voices, all numbers, all analytics in the same room together. Laura, thank you so much. You, you, you mentioned extreme weather and uh, we are winding down a little bit here. I wanna make sure we uh, uh, save some time for uh, any, any uh, questions from the commissioners. But um, as you know, Many of you know, uh, the Commission's Extreme Weather NOPR issued in June of this year under docket number RM22-10 proposed to require NERC to develop reliability standard modifications that require consideration of extreme heat and cold events. To what extent, if at all, 
would a minimum interregional transfer capability requirement complement or con conflict with such a shift in the NERC standards? Uh, Laura, since you, you just mentioned it, but um, if you don't mind, could you take that and, and maybe we could turn to Daryl as well. And Aaron, it looks like Aaron has something to say as well, so. Um. Absolutely. Um, I think it would be hard to say that planning for extreme weather and interregional transfer capability, um, having that broader insurance policy don't mesh well together. Um, going and looking at the extreme weather, there's certainly there's an operational component that you need to be able to um, to be light on your feet, to go and dodge and weave around the challenges that the day will throw at you um, to make sure that you have that. But also it's making sure that you go and have the right plans for those extreme hot and cold days so we do think that they are um, complementary, certainly not mutually exclusive. And it's another great example of areas that we need to make sure we're talking to each other as we go and plan for the next, the future coming up. Thank you, Laura. And, and definitely don't mean to limit it to any, any particular panelists. So please, if anyone else has anything to say, please go ahead. I see Aaron and then uh, David right after him. Um, I, I think these activities can absolutely be complementary, and they should be. The, the risk of extreme events, particularly as characterized by correlated forced outage rates, is unhedged and unmitigated at an interregional level today. And I think the, the proceeding that you already have open on extreme events is the right on-ramp to talking about this topic. So I think that they are kindred fellows and can be designed to work together. Yeah, and so... When I think about, um, you know, NERC standards, typically they they don't just require um, consideration of an issue like extreme weather, right? There's typically also a requirement to do something to uh, show that you can address the um, the issues that may arise when you consider that particular issue. So I think there is uh, definitely the opportunity for um coordination between any sort of uh, minimum interregional transfer capability requirement to the extent that that doesn't become the sole solution to um, any issues that may be identified out of an extreme weather um, event. And I know this entire um, conference is focused on the topic of an interregional transfer capability requirement, um, but I think we need to be open to the fact that there may be other um, just as viable ways to provide the type of insurance or risk mitigation that we've been talking about in this panel, other than uh, just through interregional transfers. I know that a few years ago, there was uh, a, a pretty hotly contested um, proceeding around uh, resiliency and fuel assurance, which I think was talking about a lot of the same issues that we've been talking about today, although that was a different uh, way of approaching that particular issue. And, and so I just think we need to be open to there are potentially many ways to address these types of issues, such as extreme weather. Thank you, David. Daryl? Yeah. Um, so I, I do... I do see these uh, as complementary um, in, in some respects. Uh, I also think, you know, the concept of resiliency is just so much broader than, you know, extreme hot and cold. Uh, and I know that that RM22 will actually go on to, to probably look, or maybe there are future, future um, you know, uh, order or NOPR will, will sort of talk about drought impacts as well. Um, and I guess that would sort of extend to wildfire risks and that kind of thing. But of course, we have to think about, you know, tornadoes and, you know, other acts of God, right? Uh, hurricanes, um, cybersecurity is important. Um, and, you know, sabotage, you know, all of these things play a role in how we think of uh, a resilient grid, a, a grid that can actually take on additional contingencies and still, you know, serve uh, customers and keep people safe. Um, and so I, I do think they're complementary, but I, I do think what we're talking about maybe even goes a step beyond it, right? You know, in the R22-10, it's, it's really looking at, you know, these specific types of events and making sure that you're properly studying them. I think what's important here, um, you know, and I mentioned earlier, you know, that I do think NERC is the right place to um, impose a standard, even if it's the sort of interregional planning groups like West Connect and the, and the like that are actually identifying how to meet that standard. Um, 
you know, I, I think it's important uh, to to realize that um, you know, citing transmission lines is has is has not you know is historically difficult and has become much much more difficult, uh, and so we really need the states. Uh, engaged and involved in this process of understanding the risks to ratepayers, uh, and then supporting you know the approval of these transmission facilities to mitigate those risks. And so the states have a, a, a big role in this as well. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator Matt. Uh, uh, I, I think he has a couple of additional questions. Um, Matt, would you like to? Finish us off, please. <laughs> Thanks, I mean, Yeah, it looks like we've got a little bit of time. And so I wanted to follow up with Adria um, in, the, in the presentation you gave earlier today. Um, it, I couldn't help but notice there was a gap between the additional transmission built according to the 15% bilateral minimum requirement that you modeled and the L, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab results on the, the value of interregional transmission presented by Dev earlier today, and um, the transmission developed in capacity expansion models that you reviewed. So I, this is questions to you, but also I welcome other panelists uh, to, to respond. Do you have any insights into what's driving that gap between yeah. what the minimum requirement would do and, and you know, the value? And um, how might a minimum requirement close that gap if, if it could? Sure thing. And since it's been now two hours since I presented, I just want to remind everyone that the views I expressed today are my own, not those of the Department of the Secretary. She may give you a different answer to this question. But um, in general, the 15% bilateral TCBD minimum requirement, that was just a number that was chosen because that's been thrown around. That's been discussed in the industry. It was by no means linked to congestion value. It was not linked to historic fossil prices. It also was not linked to scenario planning, right? So that shows this uh, the gaps that we could see if we were to just choose a number and try to apply that uniformly to all transfers versus trying to base that in some type of transmission value or trying to base that um, in scenario-based planning. Great, thank you so much. I'm wondering if any of the other panelists would like to address that question. I see Daryl, you have your hand raised. Would you like to add to the conversation here? Yeah, I mean, uh... First of all, EJ, I, I, um, I, I don't think the slides do justice uh, of how important, you know, this and this, these analyses are. Um, and specifically, you know, if you look at PDF slide 14 and, you know, sort of compare uh, the 15% re requirement against congestion value of transmission, I find that I found that slide incredibly interesting. Um, you know, especially uh, the, you know, the, the correlation between, um, you know, the sort of ERCOT and SPP region. Um, but uh, on this sort of topic of um, that Matt brought up on, on you know, the slide where we have that gap, I, I, I actually have the same question. And I wondered, um, you know, with MISO's location, uh, you know, how, how important it is, you know, you sort of posit later on in the slides, you know, what, what should we be considering in sort of setting a minimum? Uh, should we be considering not only your neighbors, but your neighbor's neighbors? Um, and I actually think that that what we're seeing here with MISO and even maybe the PJM to some degree is, um, you know, is is the fact that you can't just look at your your next door neighbors. You might have to look at your neighbor's neighbors. As everybody knows, we've got a, a, just a ton of really great wind resources in Western SPP. Um, and if they just looked at their neighbors, you know, we've got a really good set of renewable resources in MISO as well. How do you get that, you know, into PJM and in, you know, further east, right? And I think what we're probably seeing are the, the, the fact that, you know, you, you kind of do need to look at your neighbor's neighbors in order to get it right as far as interregional transmission capability is. And just a quick response to that and what Dale brings up is getting to your neighbor's neighbors, a lot of that is going to be shown more if we're doing the scenario-based planning and how we create these numbers um, or create these minimums. Um, but also the the regions that had the most growth when we apply that 15% bilateral capacity minimum, a lot of that's just because which neighbors had the most, or sorry, which regions had the most neighbors, right? So if we're looking at applying this to all bilateral, then those who are connected to three, four plus regions are going to have a lot more um, required growth. Thank you, Adrian, for that perspective. I see uh, Debbie and Sharon both have your hand raised if you would like to answer this question. If also any other panelists want to talk about the, the topic of neighbors' neighbors, I think that's something we'd like to hear on. 
Um, sure, thanks, Matt. So I, I think the question is it so much the gap between uh, the 15%, like Adria said, it's an arbitrary value and the LDNL results, but maybe the gap between the, the studies that um, Adria showed and the LDNL results of value. And um, I was trying to say this, and I'm sure I was not very coherent, um, but uh, you know those capacity expansion modeling um, tools, they, they don't look at all at forecast errors of load and wind and solar in the operational time frame. That stuff is going to become increasingly really, really important. And then also the fact that we're not good at like potentially predicting what you know potential things might happen in the future with um, uh, correlated events. So I, I think a lot of that may also be driving some of this um, uh, difference in what Adria has seen in capacity expansion models and the LBNL folks are seeing. Great, yeah, I think that's one consistency is that the future will be different than the past. Um, Sharon and Aaron, I see you both have your hands up. If um, Sharon, you'd like to go first. Sure. Um, I would just add to the comments and the conversation we're having on neighbors, neighbors, that in my mind, this reinforces once again that just applying interregional planning to RTOs or non-RTOs doesn't really make a lot of sense when you're talking about your neighbors, neighbors. And in my mind, it gets back to the point of you're talking about interregional planning between the order 1000 regions and it applies nationally and then in my mind also that often the topic of your neighbors neighbors gets into the the concept of well who benefits from these projects it's not just your neighbors but your neighbors neighbors that benefit from it and that also gets into cost allocation and cost causation issues and that you're talking about um, your neighbor's neighbors also benefiting from these projects. And when you start getting into that level of granularity, it also means that FERC cannot ignore governance issues when it comes to the governance structures differing between your neighbors and your neighbor's neighbors. And that independence in transmission planning matters because in this situation, your neighbor's neighbors may be paying for it. And when you start talking about your neighbor's neighbors, it also means governance matters in terms of ordering um, and approving these types of projects. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you for talking about cost allocation. We'll talk more about that tomorrow afternoon. Aaron, would you like to add to the conversation? Yes, I think um, the, the the topic of your neighbor's neighbors really calls attention to the fact that we need a, a rolled up view of what is happening more broadly across the interconnection. I think we see a very good rolled up view from WEC. That is a very good model that should absolutely be implemented in the Eastern interconnection as well, um, and then probably extend it even further. Uh, but I think that's where the neighbor's neighbors topic comes in. We need that overarching who can look at that broader area of view, whether or not they take action on it. I think we could discuss that at a future time. First step is observe and report. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron. And Laura, I see you have your hand up. And Sharon, is your hand up to respond again? Or OK, great. So yeah. Laura and then Sharon. So um, thank you for the chance to speak to this. I do think that there's a lot of value in a framework that looks broadly on how we go on beyond the scope of Order 1000. Um, planning with our neighbors, both markets and non, is really valuable at the end of the day. Um, and one other thing is I've talked a bit about the value of operational planning as well as the day-to-day -day operations. It's important to think about, especially as you talk about building upgrades and building upgrades on your neighbor's neighbors or, or talking about transfers for your neighbor's neighbors. It's not enough to identify. Um, it's not even enough to identify and allocate cost. You really have to think about how you utilize those day to day. And that gets into your joint operating agreement. It gets into your day to day operating practices. And those are um, equally important to the transmission build out. Great, thank you for that perspective. And Sharon, I'd like to respond. Yes, um, one thing I wanted to also mention when we are discussing the concept of neighbors, neighbors, 
Um, one concept that LS Power had put forth in our original NOPER comments is that the con the, that that when we're talking about governance and your neighbors' neighbors and the various regions, we think that means that instead of um, applying these standards to say RTOs versus non-RTOs, it means that you could increase the governance requirements over the Order 1000 regions to apply an independent system planner concept. And so therefore, um, we mentioned that starting in page 65 of our NOPER comments, or a, a NOPER comments, and spend about 10 or 15 pages talking through what an independent system planner standard would require. But if you had an ISP and an independent system planner standard applied to the various Order 1000 regions, it would assure appropriate independence in the transmission planning that occurs for your neighbor's neighbor neighbor's regions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. At this time, I'd like to see if any of the commissioners that are online have any questions for our panelists. I welcome the commissioners to raise their hand if they have any questions at this time. Uh, Allison, or Commissioner Clements, I see. <laughs> no, no questions. I, I keep coming up with them and then people keep weighing in on them. Uh, really nice job asking them, guys, and thanks for the input. It's a lot to chew on. I, I agree. There's a lot, <laughs> a lot for us to chew on today. I, I really appreciate all the panelists' perspective, and I think we have a few more minutes, and Samin has a question that he would like to ask with regards to consistency of modeling across regions. Samin, would you like to ask that question? Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, it's nothing we haven't covered yet, but I just wanted to make sure panelists had a, uh, wh whoever um, wanted to cover this could. Um, so a number of you have discussed the issue of standardizing modeling across regions versus allowing flexibility between regions. We also heard that in the first panel. Uh, would you care to elaborate on that debate? Um, Sharon, we can start with you. Unless, oh, sorry, it looks like your your hand was raised from before still. Um, Laura. So um, I think when you start talking about the, the ability to create a common set of scenarios, that's where a lot of the discussion and dialogue are really useful. Um, I know the Eastern Interconnection Planning Collaborative um, has spent some time on that and discussing consistency around the outage patterns we have, the load shapes, those are useful. Um, I also would posit that it's not necessarily mutually exclusive to have common models, but also have differences in benefits that are applied above and beyond those per region. So you can use common models to say, here's value in transfers and here's the reliability benefits or the resiliency benefits, and then still talk about um, state specific or local, more localized needs in addition to those. So I would encourage that any um, common set of models are used as a framework and not uh, set up as the once and final answer. Thank you, Laura. Daryl, would you care to uh, elaborate on that? Uh, so I just, you know, I guess uh, on the topic of transfer capability, um, you know, it occurs to me that just as an example, um, Arizona Public Service uh, recently transitioned from a path-based to a flow gate-based uh, methodology of, of calculating ATC. And I think that that's um, the kind of stuff that is going to be important as we try to figure out, you know, how to sort of evaluate, you know, what is that minimum that that each region is, is um you know, how, how are you meeting that minimum and how do you calculate it and how do you deal with the fact that there are going to be sort of interregional players that take different approaches to that calculation. Um, and I just, I feel like that's just a matter of coordination and, and to the extent FERC has, has a say in, in the approval of the formulaic approach, you know, it will be, you know, similar to going to, to FERC with a tariff, uh, you know, a modification to your tariff that has to be reviewed. Unfortunately, it's, a, it's extra work, but you know, those, those part, if they're using a typical approach to, you know, some, one of the mod standards to come up with the calculation, as long as those regions are uh, agreeing to the methodology, 
you know, I think that uh, so the differences should be, you know, workable, right? As long as they're agreeing on the process they're going to uh, use for their interregional plan. Thank you, Daryl. Aaron? Yes, I think the key issue continues to be transparency about the data and the methods and also synchronizing the study cycles. So we often run into a situation where region A and region B are doing their studies, not only with different data, but also at different time. It might not even be in the same year. Um, and that really slows down the process. So simple things like the timing of the studies, when do we do them? And then making sure that you have transparent methods that share your data, your assumptions, and your models. Those are critical steps that we unfortunately get wrong way too often. So in addition to caring about the criteria and the models and methods, please focus on the timing as you think about this. Thank you, Aaron. We'll turn to Saad as well. Yeah, I think it's 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 important to keep in mind the um, the, the physics of the system. You know, when when modeling and and how transfers are 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 modeled, is is that there the the transfers are are, are going to go from the areas of the system that are rich in resources to the areas of the system that need resources the, that that are in need of energy. So I think that's that's a key component in in terms of of how you model that, and then in also in ensuring that that there is going to be sufficient transfer capability that is going to be available when the system conditions uh, require them, them them to be available. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a long day, I know. Uh, uh, thank you so much to our panelists. It's. Uh, we, we're nearing the end of our time. Uh, so if th there are no other uh, comments from the panelists about that last question, I'd like to conclude. Thank the panelists again. Um, I've been here for two hours. Uh, so uh, uh, just just want to thank you for the, for also the ro robust back and forth that, that there, there's been throughout the day. So uh, uh, we appreciate your participation this afternoon. I'll now turn it over to Jessica Cockrell to close out the workshop for the, for the day. Thanks, Samin. Thanks, Matt. Um, definitely want to thank all of our moderators for a job well done today. And thank you to all of our panelists on panels one and two for a really great discussion. I think we had a lot of really good conversations today and um, opened up a lot of complicated issues. We have a lot more questions, I think, than what we started with. I think we got some answers. We got a lot more questions identified, but I think it's it's because it's complicated. It's a thing that's not currently happening. And I really appreciate everyone's time and thoughtful responses to um, the questions we posted on the notice. So just a couple closing out things. Um, we will be continuing our discussion tomorrow, starting at 12 p.m. Eastern time with our third panel um, discussing the process for establishing potential interregional transfer capability requirements. And then after a break tomorrow afternoon, We'll conclude with our fourth and final panel discussing um, meeting the goal of increased interregional transfer capability. Um, so with that, we are at about at time. I want to say thank you again for everyone in your participation. Please do watch tomorrow. I think um, we will likely want comments after this. And so um, having heard discussion today, I think, and discussion tomorrow, um, I think will help us to build a really good record to better understand this really interesting topic. So thanks, everyone.